Hi, everyone. Welcome. Yay! Welcome. Welcome to a revolution in neuroscience. Hopefully you all heard that revolutionary music. Yay. Um, alternative models of consciousness. My name is Allison Paradise. I'm one of the co-organizers of this event with Mona Sabani. She'll be speaking after me. We are so glad that you're here. On your seats, you might have found a little piece of paper. If you scan that QR code, it will take you to a website. And on that website, there are three really important things. The first is a place to input your email address. You might have noticed, hopefully you've noticed, the cameras that are everywhere. We're recording this event. So if you'd like to receive a copy of the recording, we need your email address to send it to you. So please sign up so that we can send that. The second thing on there that's also very, very important is our link to our GoFundMe. This is being put on by us as individuals. And it really takes a community to put on an event like this. And so we're asking all of you who obviously find value in this work to please contribute both your ideas while you're here and financially. I'd like to thank the people who have already donated. So this is a list of people who have supported this event already, many of whom are not even here tonight, but they still wanted to support it because they knew how important it is. And then, of course, we'll be adding you <laughs> at the end of this. If you are unable to donate through that link for some reason. There's also a Venmo that you can use. It's at the epicenter, one word. It's a business account. The third thing that you will find in that website that the QR code links to is the program for this evening, which we changed around just a little bit. So it's going to start with me, obviously, and then Mona speaking. And then we're going to get to the more formal presentations. I'll present followed by Julia and then Bernardo Castrop. Jonathan Schooler, and Donald Hoffman. And then after those presentations, we're going to have a panel discussion. And Christoph Koch, who's here with us, is going to join that panel. That's an opportunity for you to ask questions of everybody who's presented. And then after that, we'd like to have it be an open conversation, because it's our feeling that we are not the only people who know something about consciousness. We all experience it. We all believe that you have something valuable to contribute, and so we'd like to have this be an open conversation about consciousness with all of us. So we're going to open it up. There'll be microphones coming around, and please feel free to contribute anything that's on your mind. I mentioned that this is being recorded, and I think it's really important to, to thank Daniel Ingram for his incredible support of this, because we could not have this recording without him. Daniel donated equipment, his expertise, and his time to enable us to have an audio and video recording of this event for all of you and for anybody else who couldn't make it. So Daniel, thank you so much for this. <laughs> no, thank you. So I have a question for you all. How many people here, because this is open to the public, how many people here are scientists? Pretty much everybody. Okay. And how many people here have ever had an experience that you might call spiritual or mystical or you couldn't really put words around it, don't understand it? Okay, quite a few of you. Yeah, me too. So we're in good company. My experiences started when I was young. I was about three years old when I started having things that I didn't really understand. I had a telepathic relationship with my father. I saw people who had passed visions of things. And they happened for a really long time until I was about 12 and I decided I didn't want them anymore, so I just kind of closed them out of my mind. But I was still really curious about what are these. So I went to Brown to study neuroscience and the very first lecture given by Mark Baer talked about learning and memory. I was so excited. I ran up to him after this lecture and I said to him, hey, I have memories of my father fighting in the Vietnam War. And I want to understand how memories are passed down from generation to generation. And he looked at me and he said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Memories are not passed down from generation to generation. Uh, you must have seen photos or heard stories. And in that moment, I was so sad. Not because I thought he was telling me the truth. I knew 
what I had experienced, but because I thought that there was going to be this open curiosity, and instead there was just condemnation. And the same thing happened in grad school. I went to Harvard for grad school, and I thought, okay, different group of people, maybe more open-minded. <laughs> um, so I wrote a paper about consciousness, and uh, it was held up as an example of what not to do, of this will never get funded, uh, nobody's interested in this, try something else. And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe not here either. So I want to be explicit. That is not the vibe of this symposium, <laughs> right? Everything is welcome here. There is no judgment, there is no condemnation, there is just curiosity. We want to understand this, and to do that, we need to be open-minded and open-hearted. I ended up leaving grad school uh, before finishing, and I moved out to Los Angeles. And in that time, I really became a hardcore scientific materialist. This is the best way to put it. And I lost all touch with anything of the magic that I had experienced as a child. I started a nonprofit in sustainability, and I started meeting people who were a little bit more, let's say, in touch with those things. And the whole time I kept thinking, oh, you're so smart, but like you're a little soft in this area, you know? Like you're not that bright in this space. And then in 2014, I'm driving down the highway thinking about Ebola, you know, as one does. And uh, all of a sudden, I don't even know how to describe it, everything became clear. And I saw everything. And I pulled over to the side of the road, although I don't remember pulling over to the side of the road. And I, I called my husband and I told him I had a brain tumor. Like That's how far removed I was from this. And he, thankfully, he said, you don't have a brain tumor. You're okay. Go for a walk and uh, we can talk about it. And the experiences just started flooding back after that. In 2018, I met an Austrian mathematician named Bernard Kutzler, who was working on a book on consciousness. And I just felt I had something to contribute. So we started working on this book together, and it was published in 2019. It was published in 2019, though, without my name on it, which is another thing that I wanted to point out this evening, is that I know there are many people in this room who have done work they haven't been given credit for. That doesn't mean that you don't have something to say or contribute. For five years, I haven't spoken about the work that we did together because I felt like I didn't actually have a voice because my name wasn't on that book. This is the first time I'm talking about it. So let that not be the case for all of you. Anybody who's in that space, speak up. What you have to say is valid and meaningful. After that experience, I, I really had a hard time keeping within myself some of the things that I was experiencing, and at some point people started to notice. And I was put in touch with Jeffrey Kripal, who's really a very special human. And he said to me, I know who you need to talk to, Mona. <laughs> and I'm gonna let Mona take it from here. Thank you, Allison. And thank you all for being here. We're really, really very excited. So. I'm going to first speak about my personal story and why we wanted to organize this event. Then I'll move into speaking about consciousness and emergent phenomena to set the stage for tonight. So uh, I got my PhD in neuroscience from University of Southern California. I did a postdoc at Vanderbilt um, under the MacArthur Foundation's Law and Neuroscience Project. Then I moved into digital health. But for tonight, <laughs> the real story that starts is uh, it starts with my culture. So I'm Persian, and Persian culture is actually quite mystical. Indigenously, we are Zoroastrian. So we have a few mystical rituals that we pass down generation through generation, one of which is called divination, or using some sort of medium like tarot cards, or a book of poems, or coffee grinds to intuit something about someone's past, present, or future. My grandmother taught my mother this skill and it was through these practices that I encountered the emergent. When doing a reading, my mother would casually drop details about some of the most private, intimate, and meaningful moments of my life, things that she would have no way of knowing about. I promise I would, there were things I would never tell her. More often than not, she would foretell things that would come true, sometimes months in advance. 
Then, during a difficult time in my life, I started having dreams that I would later learn are called precognitive. They would come true with startling accuracy. So, but at this point, I was a hardcore scientific materialist, so I went on a long journey of confusion, existential crisis, an identity crisis, you name it. I thought I was crazy and alone, because a good scientist doesn't believe in weird or impossible things, right? Um, but the experiences cannot be denied, and you can only live in cognitive dissonance for so long. So I launched a personal project to interview mystics, intuitives, scientists, and more, to understand the nature of the universe from multiple perspectives. Um, and then I wrote a book about my experiences. When I met Allison, we quickly became excited about finding other scientists who had had weird experiences. At last year's SFN, Allison and I organized a neuroscience and spirituality social. I booked a really small room because I thought, how many scientists could there really be willing to show up to this? But more than 50 scientists showed up, and it was standing room only. Grad students, postdocs, faculty, they wanted to talk about psychedelics, psychic phenomena, consciousness, spirituality, reincarnation, and more. I was blown away by how many scientists were not only willing, but eager to discuss these topics. The word that comes to mind actually is hungry. So we wanted to do, do this again this year. And I have to be honest, though, I don't love SFN. It's a very cold conference to me. But somehow I found myself in this role of supporting others. So many scientists have reached out to me because of my book and the SFN event last year, dying to share their experiences. For many of them, it seemed like it was the first time that they were sharing these profound, life-changing experience with, experiences with somebody else. So if I can help destigmatize these topics so we can not only understand them better, of course, um, but also help people not feel isolated, then I want to do that. So tonight, this is not a neuroscience symposium. Think of this more like a creativity workshop where we're using consciousness as the medium or the topic. So feel free to ask off the wall questions. The questions that you would never ask inside the actual conference, you can ask those here tonight. Um, the no question or topic is off limits. The energy of tonight is moonshot energy. This is a space to play with ideas, the crazier the better, because we rarely ever get to do that anymore in science. So for inspiration, I will just drop this reminder that some of the most paradigm flipping, groundbreaking ideas in science were first shunned, dismissed, or denigrated by the colleagues of those revolutionary scientists. Galileo's colleagues wouldn't even look through his telescope. So this is also a polite and friendly reminder that science developed almost entirely out of a single worldview, that of white European men who are trying to understand the mind of God as they conceived of it. Science still suffers from ethnocentrism or the belief that if modern science has failed to explain some aspect of nature, then no culture in the history of the world could have made a genuine discovery about it. So tonight we reject that. All perspectives are welcome. That's why I wanna bring in the aspect of creativity to blow up the boundaries in your mind. Okay, so that's about tonight, and now I'll just give some brief remarks on consciousness, emergent phenomena, and the time we find ourselves in. So, okay. Uh, consciousness is one of science's most perplexing mysteries. How are we aware that we are aware? It's often broken down into the easy and hard problems. The easy problem goes to neuroscience, where we try to identify neural correlates of consciousness. The hard problem is how to explain the subjective or ph phenomenological experience in physical terms. We call this the mind-body problem, and philosophy has debated it for millennia. So disclaimer, I am not a philosopher, so I'm not going to go into great detail, and this is not a comprehensive list of philosophies about the nature of reality or consciousness, but it's just a brief primer. So one philosophy is called scientific materialism, believes everything is reducible to the physical. This is where modern day science lives. Oops, oh no, okay, moved. Or, um, and where it is argued that consciousness is an emergent property of the physical brain. Another philosophy called dualism posits a clear distinction between mind and matter or the mental and physical, arguing that they are two fundamental substances or principles in the universe, but that they are fundamentally different. And at the opposite end of the spectrum is idealism, which posits that thought and ideas or the mental or consciousness make up reality 
and that the physical is somehow derived from the mental. So this debate is far from being resolved. There are new headlines every day. But I bring it up to set the stage because neuroscience assumes the philosophy of materialism and that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain. That is one of the invisible assumptions in the research. And in recent years, there have been some interesting other, model, other models published, and we'll be discussing some of those today, but it's worth touching on philosophy because some of the other models may stray out of materialism. Okay, and now I'm gonna talk about emergent phenomena, scientists, and stigma. So there are a class of human experiences that are weird. And in this talk, I will refer to them as emergent phenomena, but they are also known as spiritual, mystical, energetic, ecstatic, kundalini, peak, or transpersonal experiences. These are experiences such as feeling like you've encountered the divine, become one with the universe, are part of a unified energetic field, or have expanded awareness or consciousness. When I was doing research on these topics, I found that many scientists have had emergent experiences. And I believe this makes sense because they are typical human experiences that we have just come to ignore and deny. There are numerous organizations for scientists, physicians, and scholars interested in these topics. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I am just gonna mention the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium. Since as Allison mentioned, Daniel Ingram, one of the co-founders, is our AV specialist tonight. Thank you, Daniel. Um, but the, the EPRC's uh, mission is to scientifically study emergent practices like meditation and psychedelics, providing valuable information to healthcare systems. That's my summary. <laughs> Um, but in mainstream science, there is still very strong stigma. I probably don't even need to cite a study here because we all know it's true, but I will. In one recent study, scientists and academics who have reported having spiritual awakenings said that some of the barriers they felt with regard to sharing their experiences with their colleagues included being misunderstood or ridiculed by others. Of those who did share their experiences, only 52% received a supportive response. So their fears were not always entirely unfounded. So why is this important? Because an increasing number of Americans and others worldwide have had mystical experiences because of the increase in contemplative practices. And that number is about to explode with the FDA-backed, venture-funded psychedelic renaissance. Why? Because psychedelics flip worldviews. There are now a number of studies showing that psychedelic use nudges the user's belief system away from materialism and toward non-physicalist and metaphysical beliefs, such as believing in mind-body dualism, the existence of spirits, belief in the afterlife, and that other entities besides humans have consciousness, such as plants or the universe. These experiences, you know, they're great because they ignite self-transformation and people can come out the other end feeling an increased sense of meaning and connectedness to humanity, but I can tell you from personal experience, worldview flips are lonely. Processing a radical shift in one's reality can lead to an identity crisis and feeling alienated, isolated, and lonely because you feel like you can't share the experience with family, friends, or community. So that's why I'm bringing this up. Emergent phenomena are considered impossible right now, and they are explained away as subjective misperceptions and evolutionary meaning making, and sometimes neural correlates are thrown in to explain them. And while it's helpful to have neural correlates, they don't actually explain why anybody would experience any of these things instead of some other state. They only describe how these experiences occur through physiology in the brain. You can't explain why this happens with neuroscience alone. You need other fields. So this is actually happening. It's not theoretical. So we can't simply ignore these experiences or alternative worldviews like we have been doing. A challenge for the West is coming. Can we be a plural and empathetic society that holds space for people who have different views than our own? Sharing these experiences can reduce stigma and increase understanding in those who have not had them themselves. And this will become more important in the upcoming years. And to be super explicit, we cannot have masses of people who are flipping worldviews and having emergent experiences be told by their friends, families, colleagues, and especially their physicians that they are crazy or that it's all in their heads. At best, that is not helpful. At worst, it's harmful. Okay, so how does this all relate back to consciousness? During altered or non-ordinary states of consciousness, such as psychedelics or meditation, there is a significant increase of emergent experiences that we for now ignore because we can't properly explain with materialism. Theories other than materialism, such as 
ones that include broader consciousness or consciousness is fundamental, sometimes better explain some of the anomalous data we have to ignore right now. So it's all worth having a conversation and exploring these different models. And I hope I've set the stage for tonight. Thank you for your attention. And I will hand it back to Allison. Thank you, Mona. Okay, wait, there's the thank you. Hello again. Uh, for those of you who just walked in, I'm, I'm Allison Paradise. I'm really excited to share this presentation, what we talk about when we talk about consciousness. I thought it would be important to define the term consciousness. Now, I know we don't have a definition for it, so I'm going to share with you a perspective, something that I think is helpful, so that we can start by answering what is consciousness, and then we can use it as a basis for discussion for the rest of the evening. And then from there, once we have a definition, we can talk about what the consequences of it are and how we can apply this understanding. And for me, these latter two points are the ones that are the most interesting. I mentioned earlier about this book. A lot of what I'm going to share with you tonight comes from this book. I don't have time to go through the derivation of everything, so I'm going to share the findings. If you're interested in this topic, if you want to learn more, if you want to see the full extent of what we found, I encourage you to check it out. Okay. So what is consciousness? We found consciousness to be a knowing of one's history, of oneself. I should probably forewarn you, this is all going to be quite simple. And I think it's because the truth of things, when you try to get to the heart of them, they tend to be pretty simple. So what do I mean by this, knowing of one's history or oneself? Well, let's imagine, let's imagine this pink dot is yourself in this moment, now, 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 over time, right? It accumulates over time. It's a little bit easier to see it, though, in a cylinder, where the very top circle is this present moment, and everything that happened prior to there is the past comprised of these present moments now. This whole thing is our self. So consciousness is a knowing of this. This is different than in opposition to awareness, which is a perception of the body state. So if we use that same cylindrical model, the consciousness is the present and the past, and awareness is happening just at that very surface at the present moment. And what we found with this understanding is that while all life forms are aware, humans are the only ones that are conscious. I know I'm making bold statements here with literally nothing to back them up, so bear with me. We're going to go a little bit further into this. And we're going to do that by looking at the consequences. So what are the consequences of consciousness? There's actually quite a few, but there are two I want to choose for tonight to talk about. The first is an experience of separation, and the second is the ability for us to create. We're going to start with separation because it leads into creation. This is a statement I think we can all agree on. We experience separateness. I experience myself as separate from you, as separate from this podium, as separate from this computer. And this is kind of obvious if we know of a self, then by definition, we know of a not-self, right? If we know of one, we know of two. So we know of separateness. But we also can experience non-separateness. As Mona just described, as many of you raised your hands, a lot of us have experienced a space where we're self is dissolved and we're one with everything. And it's in this space that we tend to use the word consciousness, at least capital C consciousness and a universal consciousness. So how do we reconcile this idea of me saying that we found consciousness is a knowing of one's history with this broader idea of this oneness with everything. Well, we need to explore consciousness a little bit more deeply to get to that point. And we're going to do this by using this image. So in this image, this neuroscientist who is looking at the sunset is going to represent the space of separateness, the perspective of everything being separate. And all of the black around him it's going to represent the space of no separateness. We can also call this the space of forms or material and the space of no forms. This is where things get a little bit tricky. I'm going to talk to you about a space called no form, but the minute I talk about it, I give it a form. So it's always going to be an imperfect explanation. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's because other philosophies, other <laughs> religious traditions have grappled with the same problem. But I'm going to do my best because I think it's important. And I'm going to do that by changing this formulation. Instead of calling it no form, I'm going to call it entanglement at large. 
And that's what we call it in the book. So if you have an experience or an understanding of the concept of entanglement from quantum mechanics or physics, then you can apply that to this space, a limitless space where there's non-duality, non-locality, there's no separateness, there's no time. It's very hard to conceive of, and it's everywhere and also nowhere at once. Okay, got it? Super clear, right? Okay, that's our space. And then we have to ask, well, where is consciousness? I know, as Mona mentioned, that many people want it to be in the brain. And we found otherwise. We found that, in fact, it's in that entanglement at large space. Bless you. Or eel is what I call for short. Bless you. And in some ways, you can kind of see now how these things start to be reconciled. Because yes, consciousness is a knowing of the self and the history. And it exists in this space of no separateness. So suddenly, those two perspectives aren't really at odds anymore. In fact, they complement each other. So our body, let's say, interacts with this space. There's a pink arrow, hopefully you can see it, that's going up from the body to the present moment. So that's the abstraction of our sensory situation that becomes a perception. And then immediately comes back down. So we have this beautiful circle coming from what's happening with our body state up to this present moment and then back down again. And we can reframe that present moment as the space where thinking and perception happens. So perception being what's happening with your body, thinking being a, a kind of a property of that self, which we'll get to in a moment. You know what else comes into that present moment, which is really cool? Since we're in the space of no separateness, intuition. You know what else you can access in the space? The history of other forms. So now it becomes really clear that for example, when one meditates and one minimizes the thinking, stills the body, then those inputs into that present moment are lessened and there's more opportunity for other things to come in so we can experience more things. Now again, it's not really a space and everything's kind of all in there at the same time, but this is the best I can do to explain it, at least at this moment. So, one other really important thing. I mentioned that thinking is related to the self. So let's examine that a little bit in more detail. Let's imagine I'm outside and I see a bunny. Love bunnies. And it happens to be a beautiful day and there's a rainbow. And I have an experience of bunnies. In fact, I have many experiences of bunnies, but I'm just going to show you one. And I have experiences of rainbows. So immediately I recall these and they come into that present moment window, right? So we have an ability to recall from our history. That's a very unique thing for humans. And I have this really great ability to go, you know what would be awesome? If there were a bunny that were rainbow colored, I can create. We, as humans, we can create. That recalling and editing system, the creation, is happening in the eel space. And then it immediately comes back into our body as forms. I cannot emphasize enough how critically important and profound that is. We have this ability to create, which means that we don't have to just be beholden to our behavioral programs. So all life forms run behavioral programs. These are things like our genetic programs, all of those habits and conditions, all the things that we tend to test involving learning and memory and animals. We have those too. We all have habits and conditioned responses. That's why so many philosophers talk about us as being on autopilot and automatons all the time. But we also have a choice. We can create something different, and that is profound. We are creative beings, and we are always creating, because we are always thinking. So what do we unintentionally oftentimes create? Well, our body state, of course, you saw how mind and perception of the body are right next to each other. So we can know ourselves to be healthy. We can know ourselves to be ill. We can know ourselves to be scared and joyous. Obviously, we can create material objects, thankfully, because we have this beautiful room that we're in and this wonderful internet that's allowing us to connect with other people. We can also create things in other people by what we bring into the space. And when you know this, when you really understand this, it starts to become very clear that it's incumbent upon us to be mindful creators. 
because our creations affect everyone and everything around us instantaneously and simultaneously because it happens in a space where there is no separation. So one of the ways that I wanna just explain briefly how we employ this understanding, this perspective is in our work with children. So this organization, the epicenter that I work with, we work with kids and young adults and we take this understanding into a space where we know that what we bring creates something for them. So we're very mindful of our bodies and our mindset when we walk into the space. And then we talk to the students and we help them understand that they don't have to be beholden to automatic thinking or to behavioral patterns or things that they've been conditioned to believe are true, that they have a choice and they can choose different. And that when you have that experience, it transforms your ability to interact with yourself and with the world around you. I called this talk what we talk about when we talk about consciousness because, well, it sort of reminded me of that short story, what we talk about when we talk about love. And I bring this up because when people say, oh, consciousness has to be a product of the brain, it makes me think, well, I mean, you don't find love in the heart, right? The same way you don't really find consciousness in the brain. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean they don't leave traces in those organs. It just means you don't going to find them there. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share this perspective with you. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand it over to Mona to introduce Julia. All right, our next speaker is Julia, Dr. Julia Mossbridge. Dr. Mossbridge uses science and technology to deepen our understanding of unconditional love, time, and human experiences, like how these relate to corresponding physical events. She was awarded her BA in neuroscience with highest honors from Oberlin College, her MA in neuroscience from UC San Francisco, her PhD in communication sciences and disorders from Northwestern University, and she did her postdoctoral fellowship work in cognitive neuroscience at Northwestern University. Currently, she is an affiliate professor in the Department of Biophysics and Physics at University of San Diego, the co-founder of the nonprofit TILT, the Institute for Love and Time, the founder of Mossbridge Institute, senior consultant at Tangible IQ, and an author and co-author of multiple books and scientific articles related to mental and informational time travel, artificial intelligence, and unconditional love. Dr. Mossbridge has just moved to the DC area to further explore how she can support government science and technology efforts. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Hey everyone, um, thanks for being here. Just a second, because we're doing a lot of sitting and maybe like I invite you to stand up or move your body a little bit so you can get ready for other stuff because there's it's a long night and this is really interesting stuff and your body can, as we just learned about, um, can be tuned up and receive good stuff that way. So let's do that. Um, the other thing is that these two folks are really brave. So Mona Sobani, Alice in Paradise, are really brave. And I just, before I get into my talk, I wanted to point out, you know, my last SFN that I attended was in 1993 when I was in graduate school at UCSF. And I just got disgusted and I dropped out of school with a terminal master's and I was pissed off at the neuroscientific community for being basically, I'm just gonna use bad language, kind of shitty to people who um, had alternative ideas. And, um, I'm sad to hear that you still feel that it can be kind of cold. You used nicer language. Um, but there's also an interest that's burbling, as Mona mentioned. There's also this sea change of people who are starting to ask interesting and different questions. And that's, uh, that's the sweet spot. So I've, I'm really happy to be back at SFN in a different situation than 30 years ago. It's a bummer it took 30 years, but um, things will improve in short order, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. So my question is, can precognition tell us anything about consciousness? I'm also a walker when I give talks and it's really hard to speak into this microphone and I almost wanna see if I can, no, that's gonna suck if I pick it up. Can I pick it up, Daniel? Oh God, oh my God. It's on. Oh, okay, is this one on? So much better, <laughs> good. Um, great. So uh, I just want to thank um, 
you know, SFN, but also the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Sciences, uh, an organization I was part of founding, um, and I'll tell you more about that later. But for now, I want to talk to you about Tupperware, because it is an ancient and useful tool for theory making. And you may or may not know this, but I'm going to explain to you why I say this. And also, as you can tell, I might have been a little bit inspired by lessons in chemistry, or um, if you have seen that show. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting to hear what analogies women use for what's going on in the world of theory. And mine is Tupperware. So what am I talking about? Um, so we all know that in the Tupperware problem in your home, the question is, what is the right container for the leftovers, right? The right size container. In other words, what is the right theory for the observations? So this is the metaphor. And the other question is, how much can we fit into the container, right? How much can we explain with this theory? Those are the two questions that we even teach our students about in grad school, undergrad. These are the questions that we want you to be asking when you're trying to create a theory, okay? Here's the question we forget to ask, but we need to ask first. And you know in the kitchen, those aren't the first two questions you ask about Tupperware. The first question you ask is, where's the lid? Because the lid is a limiting factor. If you don't have a lid, you gotta start all over, put the Tupperware, put the stuff, the leftovers in a new container. So what do the available lids tell us about the right container? Where's the friggin' lid? Okay, what do I mean by a lid in this metaphor? What do the edge cases tell us about the theory? Tell us about what we might be getting wrong. What do I mean by edge cases in this context? I mean cases that violate the assumptions of the theory or we think violate the assumptions of the theory. So what we've been doing is ignoring those cases and just talking about how much we can fit in this friggin' piece of Tupperware. But we've been ignoring that the lid that we think we have is a square, but actually it's supposed to be round, you know? And, and we're ignoring that because it's super inconvenient because we could fit so much spaghetti into the container. We can fit so many observations into this theory. So what happens when you forget to examine the edge cases with respect to your theory? This is what happens. I'm sure we all know the January 2023 paper that came out in Nature about papers and patents becoming less disruptive, less innovative over time, over the last two decades. What happens when you don't look at the edge cases with respect to your theory is innovation fails because you're asking, you're just stuffing more spaghetti into the container and you don't actually know what the shape of the lid is. So neuroscience actually has a really powerful and strong tradition of looking at edge cases. For instance, people who have lesions and that those lesions cause them to behave in very different ways. It tells us something about how the brain is working, right? Or people who have what we call superpowers. They're, um, they have, a, what, or savant syndrome, let's call it that. Um, they have a capacity to do things that we would say would be like at the genius level. There's something going on there, that's an edge case. And we've kind of backed off of that um, over the last 20 or 30 years. People, I remember in graduate school being taught, this is UCSF, you know, one of the best centers for neuroscience in the world. Oh, that's just a lesion study. Like, you're supposed to scorn lesion studies, you're supposed to scorn um, studies of people who are, have uh, unique cases. Um, and that gave me a clue, because one of the things I learned in my lifetime of noticing human beings is that when something's true, but people are afraid of it, they will shame you if you talk about it. So I knew exactly where to go. You just listen for the shame, and you follow whatever's being shamed. So that, I'm just a little tip for those of you who are trying to figure out where the cutting edge ideas are gonna be. Just find out what's being shamed. Go look at that. So I believe that when it comes to the neuroscience of consciousness, we need to enter into what is called edge science. This is actually a term being used in the world of edge science. Some people would call it fringe science, but that suggests a sort of negative connotation. Edge science literally says, we need to pay attention to the edge cases that are actually gonna tell us what is right and what is wrong about our theory. So we need to ask again some old questions that people have been asking for thousands of years that neuroscience thought it had the answer to with some new eyes. 
So I'm talking radical questions like, can mind directly influence matter? Of course, we all know that that is impossible and crazy. Or you could look at Cortex online today where you could take that tiny URL and notice that there was a paper that just came out by Morris Freeman talking about a TMS study that replicated a neurological lesion study showing that people can actually influence um, digital bits with their minds. You can decide what you think of that, but the point is the question is being asked. Um, does consciousness survive death? You can take a look at that link and you can read all about the question, does consciousness survive death and realize that it's not an open and shut case as you might guess based on the bias. Can we predict future events? That's where I've spent most of the last 15 years studying that question. You can download a bunch of papers by me and other people at that link uh, addressing that question. The reason I've been addressing that question is because I'm, I'm an edge case. So like many people who go into neuroscience, you know, those who are, have someone in their family, for instance, who has cognitive impairment, they might study memory. People who have, um, you know, sleep disorders might study sleep. Well, since I was a kid, I've been having extremely detailed precognitive dreams that I've written down in my journal because I was raised by a theoretical physicist and a social worker and a clinical psychologist who all knew that I could possibly be nuts if I went around saying that I had these dreams about the future. And, and of course, also that time worked linearly, but also were willing to think about it differently. So that's how I was raised. So, um, so that's been happening my whole life. So I am an edge case. And I thought, well, I want to study that because I know it's happening, at least for me. So what can precognition tell us about theories of consciousness? Now, I'm not going to try to convince you in the remaining time that I have that precognition, which is the ability to predict future events, not using usual means. In other words, psychic stuff about the future. Yes, I'm talking about exactly that. I'm not going to try to convince you that that is real because A, I've learned that you can't convince people that that's real and B, um, I have data that's really interesting that you can download, but data never helps people. Experiences help people. And in fact, this woman, Jessica Utz, who was the president of the American Statistical Association in 2016, and who's a collaborator of mine on a meta-analysis of physiological precognition, um, you know, is aware and was hired by Congress actually to address this question back in 1995. The paper came out in 1996. She's aware that the data show that precognition in which the answer is not known to anyone until a future time works quite well. The intelligence community paid her for that. Um, they've never gone back on that because there's no data to suggest that's not the case. In other words, this is sort of a secret that's an out loud secret right? <laughs> that people just don't talk about. So um, what she found when she was the president of the American Statistical Association and gave a talk about this one of her pres presidential addresses, she said, how many in the people in this room have had an experience of a future event that um, they could not explain how they would have that information? So I'm gonna ask that question to you. How many people in this room have had an experience of a future event that they could not have had? Yeah, so it's pro approximately 20%, yeah. Um, that they have had and that they can't convince themselves they would have gotten the information some other way. And she said, how many people believe that precognition is real? And it's the same people, right? Then she said, how many people would believe that precognition is real if I showed them the data? And it was strongly convincing, big effect sizes, highly statistically significant over and over again. No one raised their hand. They said, how many people, if they had a strong personal experience, would believe in this? The hands go up. So a group of statisticians are not gonna believe the statistics. They're gonna believe their own experience, which means I'm not gonna sit here and talk to you about the data. You can deal with it, but I'm gonna tell you that um, there are existing applications of precognition that are happening today very quietly. And then the reason I know that is because I have a team of precogs who actually do this stuff. So I can just tell you, um, we support unbiased and insightful strategic intelligence. We inspire technical innovations in climate science. We address complex strategic questions in cryptography. And we direct creative engineering and energy R&D. We also work with law enforcement and they do not want um, to talk about it. They just want to use uh, precogs. Um, how could this possibly work? 
these are two models of time. So on the top, we've got the sort of standard model. The future does not exist until we get there. The bar is us getting there. So we've got walking on the moon, we've got 9-11, we've got COVID, and then we've got flying cars. So just sort of the, the recent history of humanity, or you know, America, essentially. On the bottom, we've got this other model that it all exists at once. And our attention, our consciousness is traveling across it kind of like a landscape or a painting. So you can see how in the top model, it would be crazy to say that you could get information from the future because the future does not yet exist. But in the bottom model, information from the future can leak back in time, potentially. I don't know how it works. That's why I'm interested in the physics of it. But that's one possible way to think about it so it doesn't seem so crazy. What we know from the data, my data and data from others, is that there's two kinds of precognition, and this is what gets to what this can tell us about consciousness. There are two kinds of precognition. One is called direct precognition. So my future self experiences flying cars and tells myself when I land on the moon, there's going to be flying cars in the year, whatever, 2040, right? That's direct precognition. I have the experience in the future, and I'm sending the information to my past self. So there's evidence for that, very solid. There's also very solid evidence for indirect precognition. I never experience the future event. For instance, if you work for an intelligence agency and they ask you to precognize something, but they can't tell you what it is, they just say, we have an event we're interested in. Would you please tell us about this? And you do it. All you get back is a thank you. You will never know what you did. So that's indirect precognition. It cannot be explained by my future self sending me information back in time because I will never in my lifetime have that information. So why do I make this distinction? Because they have different implications for theories of consciousness and they're both very solid. These, these, these uh, phenomena are both very solid. So we have to think about what these implications are and, you know, you can also throw this away and say, you know, she's nuts and this isn't real or fraudulent or whatever. That's fine. Um, it's not accurate, but it's fine. You can do that. But for those who are willing to say precognition may be a real thing, I'm going to check it out later. But let's hold in this in the space this idea that it's real. What am I trying to tell you about how it um, might have implications for theories of consciousness? This is what I'm trying to tell you. Direct precognition suggests that Physiological processes are time symmetric. There might be retrocausality. There might be causally ambiguous. All those terms are physically oriented. Um, mental processes, if they're in charge of what's going on with consciousness, then those have to be time symmetric, retrocausal, causally ambiguous. Um, something like time loops, if you read Eric Wargo's work, um, inform everyday awareness and perception. In fact, you could make a model of consciousness where conscious experience is actually sent from the future, always, like it's a natural part of the actual uh, process of consciousness. So these are some fascinating implications. Indirect precognition has different implications, like the universe might be personal. Intention might have causal influence. There is an informational substrate for all events that underlies space-time. That's another potential implication. I don't know if any of these are real. I'm just talking about potential implications here. And non-local influences on human perception, thought, and action must be accounted for. That's probably my underlying point. So if you take nothing from this about precognition, that's fine. I kind of use precognition as example, an example of edge science that needs to be looked at and taken more seriously and not vilified or stigmatized. But if you take if you ignore that and just say, like, what actually matters here at a meta level, our models of consciousness actually matter for how we treat other people and for how we live in the world. Edge science itself has central impacts. So both of those things, models of consciousness and asking these edge science questions, can affect diplomacy, defense, development strategies and government, human health and well-being, planetary health, education, technology, and AI. When we ask the question about, is this AI conscious, and we're very sure that it's not, you better have a definition of consciousness and understand how consciousness works, and you better understand if the mind can actually influence things directly, and therefore if an AI could influence things directly without going through a physical substrate, before you're very sure about the answer to that question. 
So as I close, um, I just wanted to point out some resources. Just today, I am so impressed, a group of students that I've been mentoring at the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Sciences got their first uh, magazine together called Consciousness Unexplained. You can download it for free here. Uh, you could go to the AAPS website at aapsglobal.com or you can go to tinyurl.com slash consciousness unexplained 2023. It's very, very cool. Stories, poems, and theories and art by students of consciousness. Here's something if you're interested in taking a picture of lots of links, you could take a picture of that. Um, I'm standing there, this is because we're in DC right now. I'm standing there next to the Lincoln Memorial and I'm holding my hands, you can't see this, but I'm a, like a sign language nerd. And one thing to know about, if you're, if you're new to DC or you don't know this, about the Lincoln Memorial, he's, the sculptor has him making an A and an L for Abraham Lincoln with his hands, a, a American Sign Language A and L. So in front of him, I'm making a J and an M because I thought that was the thing to do. That's my first and last name. Um, so anyway, thank you everyone, especially Mona and Allison and the other speakers today. Uh, who are coming up. Uh, I want to thank the precogs I work with, especially the intuitive forecasting team, uh, the clients that I've worked with, experimental participants, a bunch of donors who have been very helpful, and my, my recent co-authors that I've been working with. And I just want to remind you again, in case you missed the announcement, this, this session will cost, personally, Mona and Allison about $10,000, $20,000, anyway, which they don't have. So if you know someone at Society for Neuroscience who can waive the fees, or if you want to donate through the QR code, I encourage you to do one of those or both of those things. Thank you very much. Okay. You all hear me? All right. Our next speaker is Bernardo Castrop. Bernardo Castrop is the executive director of Essentia Foundation. His work has been leading the modern renaissance of metaphysical idealism, the notion that reality is essentially mental. He has a PhD in philosophy, ontology, philosophy of mind, and another PhD in computer engineering, reconfigurable computing, artificial intelligence, as a scientist, Bernardo has worked for the European Organization for Nuclear Research and the Philips Research Laboratories, where the Casimir effect of quantum field theory was discovered. Formulated in detail in many academic papers and books, his ideas have been featured on Scientific American, the Institute of Art and Ideas, the blog of the American Philosophical Association, and Big Think, among others. Good evening, everybody. I, I'm sorry I, I couldn't be there joining you today. I will do my best here from, from my study. I'll talk about IIT, Information Integration Theory, um, under the framework of analytic idealism, which is a consciousness-only ontology, unlike mainstream physicalism or materialism. In 10 minutes, I will not be able to argue why I think analytic idealism is right and materialism is wrong. It's just too short time to do that. Um, what I would do is I will very briefly tell you what analytic idealism is, how it differs from materialism, and then how we can interpret IIT or information, integrated information theory under the framework uh, of analytic idealism. I will not even tell you directly what IIT is, but you will be able to pick up the smell of it. It will be in between the lines, uh, so to say. All right, so let's start with mainstream physicalism or materialism. Under physicalism, when you perceive a basketball, you perceive those qualities like the colors orange and black, or even the texture and the smell of a basketball. All of those qualities are supposed to be generated by your brain inside your skull. We do not know how that happens. Physicalists do not put forward even a coherent hypothesis for how the brain could possibly operate this kind of magic. Uh, but that's, that's the presupposition um, of that metaphysics, that qualities are generated uh, by your brain inside your skull, and they only exist inside your skull. Now, there is something that corresponds to the ball that you see, 
bouncing off in the real world outside. And that something is supposed to be made of atoms that take on a spherical shape. They arrange themselves in a way that the geometrical relationships between them um, are spherical, just like the ball that you actually perceive is spherical. So under materialism, although the world out there has no qualities, has no colors, um, the contours that we perceive on the screen of perception are supposed to be the actual contours of the world. If there is a basketball bouncing in your perception, then there is something spherical bouncing in the real world outside. But that something in the real world has no intrinsic qualities. It has no color, has no taste, has no flavor, no, no, no smell, has no melody, has no texture. If you provide a complete list, list of the correct quantities or numbers, you will have said everything there is to say about the real basketball in the world outside. It's purely quantitative and purely abstract. You cannot even visualize it. But through your uh, perceptual organs, by emitting photons, for instance, that abstract thing bouncing outside modulates how your brain generates the qualities that you associate with the basketball on, on the screen of perception. So that's physicalism. Under physicalism, the very same thing applies to a skyline. Uh, there are only the contours of the skyline in the real world outside. It has no colors. It has no qualities. It only has geometrical relationships that are reflected on what you do perceive in the screen of perception, which your brain will then fill in with colors, fill in with qualities, the qualities of experience. And of course, insofar as the brain is a physical object, then the brain too is supposed to exist just as a sort of an abstract outline, an abstract set of contours and geometrical relationships that when perceived by your brain, when your brain perceives itself or the brain of another person, then your brain will somehow generate the colors, the flavors, the smells, the textures uh, uh, that we associate with the organ called um, the brain. So that's mainstream physicalism. Now, how does analytic idealism differ from this? Under analytic idealism, nature is constituted only of mental states, qualitative states. There are no purely quantitative states. Um, under analytic idealism, these, these purely quantitative states are a pure theoretical abstraction of materialism, and we don't need it. It's inflationary. We don't need that kind of abstraction to make sense of nature. We can make sense of nature purely on experiential states, mental states. And these mental states represented by the vertices uh, in this graph, um, they embody certain qualities like the color red or the bitterness of disappointment or the taste of strawberries and so on and so forth. And they can be linked together via associative links. Um, the quality of a memory can uh, bring you to a certain thought. That thought can evoke a certain emotion which can then evoke other memories. So there are associative links between uh, across mental states and different mental states can be more or less integrated. For instance, these two mental states here are dissociated from one another. There is no path in this graph uh, that can take you from one of these mental states to the other one. So they are dissociated. The others are associated. They are cognitively associated together. They evoke uh, one another. And this is what we are. Our conscious inner life is this. It's a set of mental states, some corresponding to memories, others cor corresponding to feelings, others to emotions, fantasies, perceptual qualities, and so on and so forth. And they can be more or less associated together. And when that those associations form re-entrant loops like this, then those loops integrate a lot of information and they can lead to metacognition. In other words, they can lead to a thought about another thought or a thought about a feeling when mind sort of turns in upon itself and inspects its own contents. Uh, Jonathan uh, Schooler is going, I, I don't know whether he's going to talk about this, but he produced one of the seminal papers on this notion of conscious metacognition or metaconsciousness uh, over 20 years ago. So this is what we are under analytic idealism. We have these internal cognitive states, these internal cognitive representations. But representations of what? 
for instance, when we um, have the, the image inside our minds of a city skyline full of qualities, that's a graph connecting qualities together, the colors, the shapes, uh, the, the feeling of the wind, the smells of the city. But if these are internal representations, what do they then represent if there is no external physical world? Well, there is no external physical world under analytic idealism, but there is an external world, and it is also constituted of mental states. Not my mental states, not your mental states, but mental states at large. Think of it as you think of my thoughts right now. My thoughts, from your perspective, are external. They are external to you. You cannot think my thoughts. You cannot change my thoughts merely by wishing them to be different. And my thoughts would still be here even if you were not there. So from your perspective, my thoughts are objective and external, but from their own perspective, they are subjective. They are mental. They are experiential. In exactly the same way, the idea is that there is a real external world beyond our individual minds, but it too is mental. It too is constituted of mental states, but mental states outside our individual minds. We are dissociated from the mental states that constitute the external world, just like we can have internal dissociated mental states as well. There is a, a, a condition uh, when, when dissociation is severe, it's called dissociative identity disorder in the DSM-5. It used to be called multiple personality disorder, I think up to DSM-3 or 4. So there is, there are external states, they are also mental. Now, between us and the world, um, uh, by the way, we do not know what it is like to have those mental states that constitute the world. To know that, you would have to be the world, but we are not. You are you, and I am me. So we do not know directly what it feels like to be the world. We just know that there is something that it, it feels like to be the world because it's constituted of mental states. Now, between us and the world, there is another set of intermediary states. And these states are such that they can be influenced by the external states of the world, and they can influence the external states of the world. They can also influence our internal cognitive states, and they can be influenced by our internal cognitive states. So in mathematics, we can model this as a Markov blanket, which is a set of states that form a kind of a blanket that isolate the internal states from the external states, but permit them to communicate with one another via proxy, the proxy being this intermediary state of the Markov, Markov blanket. Now, the hypothesis here is that what we colloquially call the physical world is the states in the Markov blanket. It's not the actual real states in the world out there. The physical world, physical in the colloquial sense, the stuff we see, hear, touch, smell, taste, this stuff corresponds to the states of the blanket that surrounds us as individual mental agents. Um, in this case here, I'm illustrating those states as having the qualities of pixels, the qualities of colors, if it corresponds to, to, to vision. And once we lay an interpretation on those pixels, if we interpret those pixels, we can identify clouds, we can identify buildings, and, and that's what perception is. It's an interpretation of sensory states, an interpretation of the states of the Markov blanket. And the physical world, physicality, resides only in the Markov blanket under analytic idealism. There is an external world, but it's not physical in the sense of not being exhaustively describable through a list of quantities. It is fundamentally qualitative, not made of the qualities of perception because those qualities are here in the Markov blanket. It's made of other qualities inaccessible to us, interrogation marks, which in turn modulate the qualities that we can access in the Markov blanket. That's the idea. So we still have an external world that is objective from our perspective, but that external world isn't physical. And uh, 
it is fundamentally qualitative. So there is no need to go from something that is fundamentally non-experiential to experience, which is the hard problem of consciousness. Here you don't have that. Here you only have qualities modulating other qualities, which is trivial. Just think of your thoughts modulating your emotions or, you, or your, your emotions modulating your thoughts. It happens every day. It's entirely trivial. Now, what about when there are two people, when there are two individual minds? So there is one individual mind here, and there is another individual mind here. So this second individual mind can influence the states of its mark of blanket by moving their limbs, for instance, or speaking, causing air oscillations. Um, and those states of the mark of blanket can influence external states, which through a chain of causative links can in turn influence the states of the mark of blanket of someone else, which can then modulate someone else's internal cognitive states. What does this person here see when this chain of causation happens? Well, what this person will see is someone else. The idea is that the physical body is what these states that correspond to someone else's in their life, conscious in their life, mental states, look like. The body is what our inner mental states look like when observed from across at least one mark of blanket, in this case, two. And of course, if you crack somebody else's skull open and you have a look inside, you see a brain which correlates with experience, correlates very well with experience. Why does it do so? Well, because the brain as part of the body the brain, too, is what someone's inner cognitive states look like when observed from across a mark of blanket or a dissociative boundary. So, of course, they correlate. The brain is the image of our inner experiential states. So, obviously, it correlates with our inner experiential states. There is no surprise there. And in all of this, we preserve causality, we preserve science, we preserve physics, uh, we preserve an external world but we avoid the hard problem altogether because there is no need for that impossible bridge between something non-experiential and something experiential. Um, so let me repeat this for emphasis. Under analytic idealism, the living brain is what inner mental states look like from a perspective, from across a mark of blanket. The brain is not what generates those mental states. The brain is just the extrinsic appearance of those inner experiential states, and therefore there are tight correlations between one and the other. To use another metaphor, think of the physical world as what appears on a dashboard of dials, like an airplane making measurements of the states of the sky outside. Those measurements are presented to the pilots of the airplane in the form of dial indications on a dashboard. So the indications on the dashboard correlate with the actual states of the sky. If they didn't, the dashboard wouldn't be useful. It certainly wouldn't be reliable. So of course, there is, a, there is a correlation link there. The dashboard does accurately convey salient information about the, the external states of the sky. It's made for that. But the dashboard isn't the sky. And that's the error we make when we take the physical world for the real world out there. We are taking the dashboard for the sky. The problem is that we are like pilots who were born inside an airplane cockpit and that airplane has no windows. All we have ever had is the dashboard. So we very naturally mistake the dashboard for the sky outside because we don't have a direct way to access the sky outside. Thank goodness, because if we had, we would literally melt into goulash soup because there is no upper bound to the entropy of the states of the world. But there must be a, an upper bound to, to, to the entropy of our inner states. Otherwise, we wouldn't maintain our structural uh, integrity. What creates that upper bound is precisely the fact that our inner cognitive states don't mirror the states of the world. If they did, we would have a transparent windshield to see the world as it actually is. But we can't have that. We would die. So instead, our inner cognitive states represent the states of the outside world in an inferential encoded manner that limits our internal entropy and favors 
prompt reaction to environmental challenges and opportunities. There's a lot of game theory behind that as well that maybe uh, Don, the, Donald Hoffman uh, will, will talk about uh, today. So in a nutshell, under analytic idealism, these two circles here are what we are. Um, we are a set R of inner cognitive states. We have certain states uh, that correspond to our Markov blanket. When our Markov blanket is represented on a dashboard, it will look like our skin, retinas, eardrums, uh, surface of the tongue, lining of the nose. These states can be uh, sensory states, collecting information this way, or they can be active states influencing the world through the Markov blanket. You do that when you move your limbs and you perform work in the world. Now, what, when, what about when there are many people together? Well, when there are many people together, this is what we have. We have the world as it is in itself, a set of states, psi. Um, and the physical world that you have is your own. It's unique to you. My physical world is unique to me. Your physical world is your dashboard representation of phi. My physical world is my dashboard representation of phi. You have your dashboard, I have mine. Someone else has another physical world, another dashboard. Now, your dashboard indications are consistent with mine. If you were here in my study, you would describe it in a way entirely consistent with my own description. What does that uh, say? It doesn't say that your physical world is the same as mine. They aren't. You never see the world from my perspective. You would have to occupy the same volume of that, 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 I, that I occupy. What, what's going on is that your dashboard is showing representations of the same set of states, psi, that my dashboard is representing. So the two representations are consistent because they are both representing the same thing. But that thing isn't physical. It isn't exhaustively describable through a set of numbers. That's the idea. The world out there is mental. Physicality is a dashboard representation of transpersonal mentation. Finally, integrated information theory. I am almost through. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you will smell it. You, you, you catch it in between the lines. Our brain has physical states. We can call it brain metabolism, brain activity. Um, you know, when neurotransmitters are released across a synaptic cleft, these are dynamic physical states that can be measured. And when we measure them, we get a sort of a picture of brain activity. This can be PET scan, fMRI, MEG, EEG, whatever. We have measurable physical states on one side. On the other side, we can introspect into our own mentation. We can describe what it feels like to be us, what it feels like to have, to, to experience a fantasy, to, to taste an apple, to experience the bitterness of heartbreak. We have introspective access to our internal mental state. And we know that one corresponds to the other because physicality, this, is a dashboard representation of mentation, this. So, of course, they correspond to one another. The dashboard represents the state of the sky. They correlate. What IIT is trying to do, interpreted in the way I'm proposing, is to create a bijective mapping between these two sets, between measurable physical states, states of the brain, and introspectively reportable inner mental states. By creating this bijective mapping, maybe it's not entirely bijective. Even if it's not, it's still very useful. But in the ideal case, it's bijective. By, by trying to figure out what this uh, function is, this bijective function that links one to the other, we can gain tremendous insight into our own mentation. Why? Because we know we cannot introspect into everything that is relevant about our mentation. If we could, therapy th uh, ther um, therapists would lose their jobs. You would never go to a therapist. You would never go to a psychologist because you would know what's going on with you. Introspection is very shallow. It doesn't go deep. By creating this bijective mapping, we can gain much deeper insight into what is actually going on with us. In, in, in cases of pathology, this mapping is, is all we would have. We cannot introspect into the low-level physiology in, in other words, the, the raw experience of what it means to be human, 
um, evolution has, has prevented us from gaining introspective access into that because it's an invariable. It doesn't change. We don't need to be explicitly aware of that to survive. All right, once this bijective mapping is created and calibrated based on introspection, we can extrapolate it not only into what is, in my view, wrongly called the human unconscious or the subconscious, we can extrapolate it further because you see, our brain is made of the same kinds of atoms and force fields as the rest of the universe. If the physical brain is what inner mentation looks like and the rest of the universe is made of the same kind of stuff as the physical brain, then the rest of the universe too is the extrinsic appearance, the dashboard representation of mental dynamics, transpersonal mental dynamics. So if we have this bijective mapping calibrated for the brain, we possibly can also extrapolate it beyond just the brain. So when we have a city, or a galaxy, or a moon, or whatever, that too is a dashboard representation of mental states. We can extrapolate the bijective mapping and try to have some degree of insight into, into the noumena, into what it is like to be the world, the, the inanimate cosmos uh, out there. And in Kantian terminology, that could mean that um, IIT could offer us the first attempt at a theory of the noumena, a theory of the thing in itself as opposed to a theory of the phenomena, a theory of how the thing in itself presents itself to us in perception, a theory of the dynamics of the dashboard. And that's what physics is. Physics is a theory of the dynamics of the dashboard because physics is fundamentally anchored in perception. Even if we use instruments like telescopes and microscopes, we need to perceive the output of those instruments. So everything gets filtered out through the dashboard. IIT offers us a possibility to go beyond um, the dashboard, uh, in my view. Now, just a final thought. This is a micrograph of the cerebellum, part of the brain. And this, this image is produced through a very careful simulation of the structure of the universe at its largest scales, which we call the cosmic web uh, um, in cosmology. And it is uncanny how similar they are, how the structure of the universe at its largest scales is akin to the structure of a brain despite completely different um, um, scales and, and principles of operation. And this is not just visual. You can actually quantify this by doing a spatial Fourier transform on, on the cosmic web on some control phenomena that have nothing to do with what we are talking about, like uh, clouds, tree branches, plasma and water turbulence. And we can compare the results. And if you look at the cosmic web in red, it tracks with the structure of the cerebellum at the lower ends of the scale. Surprisingly well, um, the controls in green don't track well at all. Uh, but the cosmic web and the cerebellum track very well at the lower, lower ends. And at the highest ends, the cosmic web tracks exquisitely well with the cortex. So maybe we are not far off in postulating that we could apply IIT to the cosmos because, you know, at the end of the day, the cosmos looks like a brain as well. I'll leave it here. Thanks for your time and attention. Okay, our next speaker is Jonathan Schooler. Jonathan Schooler, PhD is a distinguished professor of psychological and brain sciences at the University of California, Santa Barbara, director of UCSB's Center for Mindfulness and Human Potential, and acting director of the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind. His research interests uh, intersects philosophy and psychology, including the relationship between mindfulness and mind wandering and theories of consciousness. A former holder of a tier one Canada research chair Jonathan is a fellow of several psychology societies and the recipient of numerous grants from the US and Canadian governments and private foundations. His research has been featured on television shows including BBC Horizon and Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, as well as in print media including The New York Times, The New Yorker, and Nature Magazine. With over 250 publications and more than 40,000 citations, he is a five-time recipient of the Clarivet Analytics Web of Science Highly Cited Researcher Award. Okay, Jonathan, I'm gonna set you up. 
Okay, there you are. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to uh, to be here. And uh, oh well, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. I wish I was there uh, in person, but I um, I'm very glad to be participating in this uh, very frontier science conversation. Um, today, I'd like to um, also try to push the the frontier a little bit, introducing what we've been referring to as nested observer windows uh, and exploring the possibility uh, that there may be hierarchical information integration, which seems likely, and potentially hierarchical consciousness. I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, some two of the, the key people who've been involved in the material that will be presenting today, uh, Tam Hunt, a uh, paper that uh, we co-authored together was mentioned in an earlier um, conversation, uh, general resonance theory, and Justin Riddle at Florida State University. And, and much of the uh, material we presented today was done in collaboration with, uh, with these two individuals. So um, I'd like to begin with three really central uh, metaphors that I think are helpful in, in thinking about uh, the mind. Uh, two of them are very well worn, and, and the third one is, I think, more novel. The first one is the notion of a theater, that we uh, have a uh, experience that is very much akin to uh, that of a theater. Uh, Daniel Dennett, of course, uh, really disparaged this notion, referring to it as the Cartesian theater. And I'll actually be suggesting something more akin to a Cartesian multiplex. Uh, but the key idea is that subjective experience has very much the quality of a theater, the single window, if you will, of experience. And so we refer to this as an observer window. The second metaphor uh, is the notion of a dialogue uh, of a society or a corporation. Uh, this is also a, a, a metaphor that has been used in the past. Uh, Marvin Minsky, of course, talked about a society of mind. And here, uh, the idea is that our uh, mind may be constituted of uh, multiple windows that are in relationship to one another uh, as a dialogue when they're interacting with windows at the same level, or as a society or corporation in the sense that they're uh, hierarchically uh, structured. And uh, we'll explore the idea today that just as in a society or corporation, you have uh, lots of different individuals with potentially with, with their own streams of consciousness interacting uh, in uh, both uh, horizontal and vertical ways, that the mind may also have this uh, quality of multiple windows, potentially multiple conscious windows, uh, all interacting in our minds. And then uh, finally, and I think this is the uh, perhaps the most novel metaphor that I want to consider today, there is mosaic tiling. Uh, and here we take the metaphor of a, a mosaic photograph where each one of the pixels of the photograph is itself a photograph. So here we have a picture of Charlie Chaplin. And if you uh, zoom in, you can see that each one of the pixels of this um, image is itself a image. And the notion is, is that uh, it doesn't just have to stop there. You could imagine that each one of these individual windows is itself constituted of, of a mosaic of even lower level windows. So uh, this then gives us uh, this notion, let me just go back uh, a slide here, of uh, nested observer windows. And notice that the acronym for nested observer windows is NOWS. And essentially the, the notion is that each one of these individual windows is both a window unto itself and a pixel to the next level up. And each one is, if you will, nowing at its own a particular rate. Okay, so when we uh, think about um, the, the brain, it's, it's notable that there are these, these multiple scales. We have um, networks that are um, composed of uh, uh, individual uh, 
uh, uh, neuro or, or nu nuclei. We have uh, uh, circuits which are composed of individual uh, neurons, and we have um, pathways which are composed of individual proteins. And we are uh, suggesting here uh, that uh, there may be a sort of fractal relationship, that the same kinds of relationships between lower level windows and higher level windows uh, may be taking place at all these uh, different scales in the brain. Incidentally, uh, I, I'd like to put forward sort of my motto here, which uh, is entertaining without endorsing. I think it's very important given how little we understand about the nature of uh, consciousness and about really many things in um, psychology and neuroscience that we uh, keep an open mind. And I've uh, suggested in the past that a, a good attitude is entertaining without endorsing to, to, to explore and, and, and playfully consider alternative perspectives. And, and that's the way that I hope that you will uh, entertain the material that I'm sharing with you today. So the key uh, uh, notion, the key idea that we think may serve as the way that enables these different levels to uh, communicate with each other, to share information with each other is resonance. That there may be uh, resonant patterns potentially of, a, of electrical activity that um, enable uh, uh, these different systems to uh, both communicate with each other at the same level and up and down. So in considering this, it's useful to think about uh, neural oscillations uh, and to uh, draw on the, um, the classic uh, metaphor of the uh, steam train. So uh, when we think about uh, the mind, uh, typically, uh, we, we think about it as being composed of lots of uh, individual uh, neurons. Uh, and these uh, neurons are uh, engaging in spiking activity through action potentials. Uh, and these action potentials are, and the spiking activity of them is considered to be sort of the, the, the foundation of all uh, neural activity. There is, of course, the way in which these uh, individual spiking activities uh, add together into uh, larger uh, level wave patterns. But oftentimes, these larger uh, neural oscillations are considered simply to be epiphenomenal, much as the uh, smoke coming out of the top of a uh, steam locomotive. But what we'd like to suggest is that these um, oscillations, these larger level oscillations, are not simply epiphenomenal, but they are actually a key uh, element of the way in which uh, consciousness organizes and which information is uh, communicated up and down the uh, neural system. Uh, this is not an idea that is uh, unique uh, to us. Uh, George Bisaki in Rhythms of the Brain uh, emphasizes the uh, importance of these oscillations and Pascal Fries uh, talks about communication through coherence as being a uh, uh, a key uh, element and uh, others also have talked about the importance of, of synchrony in uh, terms of uh, the uh, maintenance of a consciousness in including uh, Christoph Koch who's, who will be uh, joining our conversation in a bit. Um, but the key idea is that we should uh, consider that these oscillations may provide a fundamental foundation for the crosstalk of the nested observer windows. Uh, so uh, in the now model, we are, it is in potentially uh, scale free in the sense that the same kind of relationship between windows may be operating at uh, different uh, scales. And the basic idea is that you have a uh, lower level, uh, uh, lower level systems, which are having a higher frequency, uh, so they are essentially uh, firing out more quickly, and then you have larger windows which are integrating all of the information from the lower ones into these uh, more sl slowly uh, frequent, slowly uh, rhythmic uh, representations. And uh, the first key idea is the formation of a theater 
And the idea of a theater is, is that it's all of the elements that are uh, in the happening at exactly the same time. So you have what creates the binding of uh, experience of, in an observer window is that all of the individual pixels are essentially uh, integrating at uh, exactly the same time, and that creates the individual theater. Then uh, the uh, second way in which um, elements, windows, um, and information integrate in this model is through coherence. And here the idea is that there's a non-zero lag, uh, much like in a conversation where one person speaks and then the other speaks and there is a relationship between them, but they're not speaking at the same time. So too, windows are uh, communicating with each other at the same level uh, in this uh, through coherence with a non-zero lag. And then as we move up and down the hierarchy, here we have a cross-frequency coupling where you have essentially, um, uh, this is like the equivalent of, of harmonics where you have uh, uh, faster uh, elements that are uh, cross-frequency coupled uh, with uh, the uh, slower elements. Uh, and this allows the summation of these uh, faster ones into uh, slower experiences in much the same way that you get a summation of the uh, individual pixels into a larger uh, window of experience. So um, then we have essentially these three processes that we think may uh, enable the integration of windows, uh, both within levels and across levels. Individual windows are constituted by a perfect synchronization of um, with the zero phase leg. Windows at the same level are communicating with one another with coherence happening in non-zero lag, much like a conversation. And then windows at different levels are uh, communicating uh, or, or transferring information through cross-frequency coupling going up and down uh, the uh, various different rates. Let me now uh, zero in on um, some of these uh, different levels. So first let's talk about um, the uh, synchrony and uh, individual observer windows. It's an interesting phenomena that um, if you uh, present a flashing light at, a, at variable rates, at one rate you experience it as being flashing, but if you just increase the speed uh, a little bit, it then you get flicker fusion and you experience it as, uh, as continuous. And um, the idea is that here, that if you have two lights that are happening, uh, that are flashed within a very close proximity of time, they all fall within the temporal frame of a single window and they're experienced as uh, fused. Whereas if they're going uh, slightly uh, slower, then you experience the discrimination between one light and the next, and that's when you experience the flicker. And indeed, it's found that flicker fusion uh, closely corresponds to the uh, alpha rhythm uh, of the uh, visual cortex, uh, which is consistent with the idea that there is a rhythm and that things that are happening within that individual window are fused into a single experience. You can actually experience that window, excuse me, that rhythm for yourself, if you, uh, let's see here, whoops. If you uh, look here, you will uh, hopefully notice a blinking uh, of the uh, spot over here. And that is actually uh, uh, illustrating the alpha rhythm of your uh, visual cortex. And we think sort of the, the span that defines uh, individual windows. So uh, now let's consider um, some other things that sort of fall out from this uh, notion of um, us having these individual windows that are integrating information uh, all into a, a single uh, unified uh, experience. Uh, and that is uh, time per perception. Essentially, you can think about uh, this, uh, this, these, uh, this oscillation of the of the top window as being akin to the uh, rate of a uh, film. So we can have, you know, you can have a very uh, fast 
film or a very slow frame rate of a film. And we can uh, consider how time perception may fluctuate as a function of changes in this uh, rate. So if you have a very uh, fast rate as uh, may happen when individuals are in uh, threatening situations, then you it's equivalent to essentially doing a speeded photography where you have a very fast uh, frame rate. In contrast, if things are very uh, relaxed and casual and uh, we're thinking abstract thinking, then you may have a very uh, slow frame rate, uh, much like um, uh, photography where you take, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it, one snapshot after uh, time, time lapse photography. Uh, and so the change in the frame rate uh, may uh, be a key element in uh, determining time perception. Now uh, let's move to um, uh, coherence. This is the manner in which one window may interact with a, uh, a separate window. Uh, here the notion is, is that much in the same way that conversations go back and forth, so too uh, different uh, windows are uh, interacting with each other uh, in a uh, in this uh, coherent uh, manner, and uh, this then leads to the notion that these individual windows may be taking place uh, in our minds, uh, hearkening back to the a very popular movie Inside Out, which was actually uh, created in collaboration with psychologists and had uh, multiple uh, different. Uh, essentially uh, individuals inside of the mind, each one um, uh, representing different emotions. And while this uh, might seem like a, a fantasy, there are actually multiple lines of research that are consistent with the possibility that we may have uh, multiple streams of potentially distinct consciousness going on simultaneously. Uh, there is dissociative uh, identity disorder, Bernardo uh, referred to that earlier, uh, and in dissociative identity disorder, uh, individuals uh, oftentimes uh, report, or well, they evidence a uh, distinct uh, personas, and these personas have amnesia between one and the other, although sometimes one persona uh, reports uh, having been present and being sort of on the sidelines as it witnesses a, another persona uh, engaging in um, sort of taking center stage. Intriguingly, there are also examples, Bernardo's also referred to these, in which a single individual with dissociative identity disorder, uh, during a dream, each one of the different identities uh, all participates in the dream, uh, allegedly or reportedly, uh, and but they all are experiencing the dream from the perspective of that individual identity. Uh, again, raising the possibility that each one of these identities may correspond to a distinct nested observer window uh, in the uh, larger mind. Uh, there's also uh, interesting research in, in the clinical literature uh, on internal family systems uh, and the notion that uh, we may have uh, essentially uh, the equivalent of a family going on in our mind with the different members of the family taking on uh, different roles and uh, that we oftentimes experience challenges because our um, internal family is uh, is at odds with one another. Uh, there's also, of course, evidence on cognitive dissonance, where we have a multiple uh, different uh, perspectives that are uh, at odds with one another. There's also, and this is, I think, some of the uh, most uh, compelling evidence for multiple streams of consciousness, evidence from split brain research in which um, you can present information. This is, these are individuals who've had the corpus callosum, uh, the two sides of their hemis the two hemispheres that is typically connected by this set of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. When you uh, ablate the corpus callosum, uh, the two hemispheres uh, in interact or behave somewhat independently. And uh, cu very curious things happen. So uh, you can show a image to, uh, to the uh, right hemisphere. Uh, and when asked, oh, when the individuals ask what they see, uh, they'll uh, report not having seen um, uh, anything. Uh, but um, when you ask them to uh, draw it, um, they will draw 
a bicycle, uh, suggesting that the right hemisphere uh, was experiencing something independently of the uh, left hemisphere. The left hemisphere says I didn't see anything, and the right hemisphere is uh, able to um, uh, report what was seen. Another bit of evidence for um, uh, these multiple streams comes from hypnosis, where you have um, a uh, individual who has been highly hypnotizable individual who is um, uh, given some sort of uh, pain uh, experience. And uh, the individual, when uh, simply asked, do they experience any pain, uh, they report no pain. But nevertheless, when um, they are asked, when they're told there's a hidden observer and asked the hidden observer, did you experience any pain? Uh, that in that hidden observer, in, in fact, reports pain. So the interpretation of this is that pain is diverted from the normal open consciousness, but is processed by a hidden consciousness. And the hidden observer reveals a division of consciousness into multiple simultaneous streams of mental activity. Uh, one more a line of research that's consistent with this notion of a multiple windows of uh, streams of consciousness simultaneously is uh, Zeki, uh, who uh, looking at a vision uh, has uh, concluded that attempts to decode what has become known as the neural correlates of consciousness, suppose that consciousness is a single unified entity, a belief that finds expression in the term unity of consciousness. Here I propose that the quest for that NCC will remain elusive until we acknowledge that consciousness is not a unity and that there are instead many consciousness that are distributed in time and space. And without going into the details of this, essentially what he points out is that there are, uh, the visual system has uh, multiple systems uh, where you have um, the color system is uh, processed um, in one system, V4, visual motion is processed in another system, of E5, and these actually take place at, at different times, and as I said, also in different locations of the brain. And the fact that these are happening at different times, as Zeki suggests, uh, and, and locations, he says the geographical separation of the two systems constitutes the cornerstone of a theory of multiple consciousnesses. So the notion that we might have multiple streams of consciousness going on in our mind simultaneously is perhaps not as uh, outlandish as it might uh, first uh, seem. Uh, finally, let me mesh, mention cross-frequency coupling. This is the way in which uh, a lower level systems may communicate with uh, higher level ones. And essentially the idea is that um, you have say the uh, firing of a um, individual neurons and those individual neurons are then uh, integrated in the, the, the activity of the different neurons is then integrated into a higher order uh, rhythm, which is the uh, experience that's higher that's happening at the uh, nuclei uh, level. And this notion that we have uh, basically windows upon windows upon windows, again, alluding to the notion of the mosaic photographs, leads to uh, many uh, uh, psychological phenomena, such as the way in which ideas seem to just pop into mind uh, the idea here is that these lower level systems are uh, integrating information and pr providing the higher level one in sort of whole cloth uh, to the large higher level window. And uh, it also um, explains why it's uh, potentially explains why it's so hard to uh, swat a fly. So as we have evolved, the idea is we've increased multiple layers of uh, windows upon windows upon windows. And these higher level windows are integrating more and more levels of um, abstraction. Uh, and that allows us to process and integrate a much greater amount of information, but at the cost of uh, uh, a much slower frame rate. And this may be why it's so hard to swat a fly because a fly is basically uh, experiencing a much faster uh, frame rate. So when we attempt to swat a fly, it's as if we are going in slow motion to the fly. This also explains the limits of submergence. Uh, in, in many situations, we are not aware of what's going on at our lower level. So when we're uh, typing, we're not aware of where our fingers are going. When we um, uh, experience uh, optical illusions, we're integrating, but we cannot control the, uh, the, the experience, say, of motion. Uh, bodily control, uh, baseball players cannot explain the full range of experiences uh, of 
physical motions that they're engaging in, say, in uh, pitching a ball. Now, oftentimes, one of the big reason challenges for uh, thinking about this notion of a theater is the homunculus problem, the idea that, well, if there's a, a little theater going on in one's mind, who's watching that theater, and then who's watching that the theater in that person's mind, and that person's mind, and that person's mind. And here the idea is that as, uh, that in fact, that's not a problem because we do have windows upon windows upon windows, but they're all processing information at increasingly uh, different levels of uh, specificity. Jonathan, so it is in you, fact, oh, yes. Sorry, I just wanted to check on time. We just want to make sure. Uh, one, I'm, I'm about one minute away. So, okay. um, uh, so it's basically turtles all the way down. And um, uh, this also raises the question of where is consciousness? It may be, um, uh, uh, the standard view is that um, it's just emergent at the top level. Zeki's view would suggest that it is um, uh, hier hierarchical, but limited to some uh, place. And then the panpsychic view is that um, it actually goes um, all the way down. And this is the one that we favor, although we entertain all of them. It also raises the possibility that there may be higher order nows. Uh, as uh, uh, was mentioned before, uh, there's a striking parallel between uh, the uh, nerve cells and galaxy clusters, perhaps each one of us is in fact a window of a, uh, a pixel in a larger level window, and that may be a pixel in a large level window. So in some then, I've introduced the now model as a novel framework that proposes multiple biological scales for hierarchical information and possibly consciousness with a theater uh, of observer windows, a society or corporation organized by coherence and cross-frequency coupling. Uh, organized by mosaic tiling. Uh, that's it, and uh, my apologies uh, for going over. Uh, the last speaker is Donald Hoffman. Uh, Donald Hoffman received a PhD in computational psychology from MIT and is a professor em emeritus of C uh, cognitive sciences at the University of California, Irvine. He is an author of over 100 scientific papers and three books, including The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes, and Visual Intelligence, How We Create What We See. He received a Distinguished Scientific Award at the American Psychological Association for Early Career Research, the Rustin Roy Award of the Chopra Foundation, and the Trolland Research Award at the US National Academy of Sciences. His writing has appeared in Scientific American, New Scientist, LA Review of Books, and Edge. And his work has been featured in Wired, Quanta, The Atlantic, Ars Technica, National Public Radio, Discover Magazine, and Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. He has a TED Talk titled, Do We See Reality As It Is? Donald, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I don't put, mean to put time pressure on you, but just a reminder, 10 minutes. Thank you. So my talk is, Space Time is a Headset. And I'll discuss conscious dynamics beyond space-time. Science has for centuries assumed that space and time or their union into space-time is the fundamental reality. And theories of consciousness have tended to assume that as well. Um, they've assumed that space and time are fundamental and that particles in space and time are, are fundamental objects within space and time. And these Particles assemble into more complicated objects like neurons and brains, and brains with the right properties uh, can create consciousness, or they can create the illusion of consciousness. And I've listed a few of the kinds of theories that are of this type. They either assume that space-time is ontologically fundamental, or that it's a, an explanatory substrate for theories of consciousness. But in, in any case, the consciousness itself is not fundamental. It, it's either, um, there's a substrate to it um, that's either ontological or explanatory. Panpsychist views, many of them also assume that space-time is, is fundamental, either ontologically or explanatorily, but that also um, there is behind the, um, the equations of physics, there is the uh, consciousness that gives the fire, and so, so to speak. But, the theories of these theories of consciousness that assume that space-time is somehow uh, important to our understanding of consciousness are missing something that um, we're being told by high-energy theoretical physicists in the last 20 years. For the last 20 years, they've been telling us that space-time is doomed. Uh, for example, Nathan Seiberg at the Institute for Advanced Study of Princeton says, I'm almost certain that space and time are illusions. 
These are primitive notions that will be replaced by something more sophisticated. Andrew Strominger at Harvard says the notion of space-time is clearly something we're going to have to give up. Nima Arkani Ahmed at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton says the very notion of space-time is not a fundamental one. Space-time is doomed. There is no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the actual underlying description of the laws of physics. And David Gross, who, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on quantum chromodynamics, um, explains why. Um, he says, there is no operational meaning to distances smaller than the Planck length. And the idea is that if you want to measure smaller and smaller things, you need light or some radiation with smaller and smaller wavelengths. But quantum theory tells us that as the wavelengths get smaller, the energy goes up. And as the energy goes higher and higher, at some point, you put so much energy, which is, according to Einstein, also so much mass, into such a small region of space that you collapse that region of space into a black hole and you destroy the very thing that you're trying to measure. So space-time has no operational meaning beyond 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds, the so-called Planck scale. It ceases to have any, any meaning. And so physicists recognize that space-time is doomed. It cannot be fundamental. And they're, they're moving beyond. They're finding new structures. Now, I, don't want, I want to mention that evolution by natural selection agrees. Um, you can, uh, it's, it's quite clear in evolutionary theory that, as, as Pinker puts it, uh, our minds evolved by natural selection to solve problems that were life and death matters to our ancestors, not to commune with correctness. And one implication of this is that our perceptions of space and time are, again, a solution to problems that are life and death matters. They're not uh, an indication of something that's true about the nature of reality. And you can ask a technical question using evolutionary game theory, the mathematics of evolutionary theory. Does natural selection favor veridical perceptions? That is, perceptions that tell you true things about the structure of objective reality. And the answer is no. Uh, when you actually do mathematical models as well as you know, tests using computational simulations, you find that veridical perceptions go extinct when they compete with um, perceptions that are more like a desktop interface. So your desktop interface allows you to avoid the reality inside your computer, all the diodes and resistors and megabytes of software. To, to write an email using that, you'd have to toggle uh, millions of electron vo voltages um, in precise sequence, and you don't want to do that. So you just have a nice little interface that hides the reality and lets you interact with it. Or you can think about evolution has given us a VR headset that lets us play the game of life, say like Grand Theft Auto. And you don't have to know about the supercomputer that you're really controlling. You just have a, a, a dashboard, a steering wheel, and a gas pedal that allows you to play the game of life. And so knowing the truth is not going to help you win the game of life, just like having to toggle voltages in the supercomputer won't help you win in Grand Theft Auto. So evolution also shaped us with space and time um, not to show us the truth. They're just a headset. So, so what we've realized is we thought that space, time, and its objects are fundamental. We now realize that, that high energy theoretical physics and evolution by natural selection, two are the pillars of modern science, are telling us that they are not fundamental. In addition, this entails that reductionism is doomed. As Nimar Khani Hamid puts it, so the entire reductionist paradigm that fundamentally physics is given by um, some things at the ultimate mo most microscopic distance scale and that somehow we just have to go there to see what's going on is ultimately false because of gravity. So what this means is attempts to build theories of consciousness by reductionism inside space-time is flying in the face of our best physics and evolution by natural selection. It's doomed to fail. Now, we've assumed that there are fundamental building blocks quite a bit in human history. We thought of earth, air, fire, and water for a while. And then we thought uh, the periodic table of elements were fundamental. Now we think of the leptons, bosons, and quarks of the standard model of physics as fundamental. And these, these fundamental particles, we, we think, you know, complicated configurations of them will lead to things like pyramidal neurons, and pyramidal neurons will lead to uh, more complicated structures like brains. And then brains, according to many of the uh, current theories of consciousness, will um, then somehow give rise to consciousness or the illusion of consciousness. Okay, so that's the, the standard uh, approach, of, I'd say, of 99% of the theories. Now, all of them are saying that space-time is fundamental, and they're assuming reductionism. 
But these theories face um, a serious problem that they, on their own terms, that's what I call the stipulation problem of consciousness. As, as Stephen Pinker put it in his uh, 2018 book, Enlightenment Now, but the last dollop in the theory, he liked the work, global workspace theory, that subjectively it feels like something to be the circuitry may have to be stipulated as a fact about reality where explanation stops. And, and this is, this that Pinker is acknowledging here is something very, very important. All these theories, um, if, you, if you ask them, you know, what successes have you had in explaining consciousness? Um, th there are none. So what uh, integrated information Q-shape must be the, the, the experience of say um, auditory space and could not possibly be the experience of visual space or what um, global workspace architecture and contents must be the smell of a rose and couldn't be the smell of garlic um, and, and so forth. What, you know, what orchestrated collapse of quantum states of neuronal micro microtubules must be the taste of chocolate and could not be the taste of vanilla. There's not a single theory that has a single specific conscious experience that they can, they can explain uh, along the lines I've just said. That we're, we're batting zero. And it's not a surprise because the framework is wrong. Space-time is doomed and reductionism is doomed. So what the physicists haven't given up they say space-time is doomed, but they're they're now in the last 10 years, they found structures beyond space-time. So this is all brand new stuff. They found something called the amplitude hedron, which allows them to compute scattering amplitudes without using space and time. This is entirely outside of space and time. The um it, it in some sense doesn't care about space and time. It's looking at deeper symmetries and it makes the, the mathematics much easier. And then behind them, they found decorated permutations. So there are there is real work being done where, where high energy theoretical physicists are finding these structures beyond space time um, that can actually compute scattering amplitudes. But it's really quite interesting that they found these structures, but they're like the obelisk in 2001 of Space Odyssey. You know, the, the apes are beating on it, they're pounding on it, they, they know it's important and it's significant, but they don't know what it means. And so here we are, and just in the last 10 years, physics has found these structures beyond space time. We, we know they're important. We know that they actually do things. They compute scattering amplitudes much more easily than Feynman diagrams. But what, what, what do they mean? What, what's out there? And so here's where I'm proposing that um, what's outside of space-time is a network of interacting conscious agents. Philosophically, this is very, very similar to the analytical idealism uh, that Bernardo talked about. I'm proposing a, a concrete, uh, dynamical model of it. And it's very, very similar to the ideas that Jonathan Schooler is talking about as well, in terms of th this is a multi-level um, Markovian dynamical system. So a conscious agent, um, uh, there's a network of conscious agents, but an individual conscious agent has its own set of experiences. Based on those, it decides what actions it will take. Based on those actions, it acts to affect the experiences of other, other agents in the network. And then their actions then affect the, um, the perceptions and experiences of the original conscious agent. So think about it as like the Twitterverse. It's, it's a huge social network of interacting conscious agents outside of space and time. And, uh, and that's what's the, the fundamental ontology here. And there is, it turns out, a, 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 nest, a nesting of this. Uh, the Markov chains are, are nested by something called the trace chain process, and it gives us a partial order. So it is very much in the same uh, in, in the found, in framework that uh, Jonathan Schooler was talking about, where we actually have a mathematically precise partial order on these consciousnesses, and it's uh, not a Boolean order; it's it's a non-Boolean order. So now a theory of of consciousness must explain this whole suite of things, um, you know, learning, memory, problem solving, the self, and and so forth. We've only assumed qualia and action. That's all we've assumed in our fundamental definition. And then we have to use our networks of conscious agents to actually build models of learning, memory, problem solving, the self, and all this other stuff. But that's no problem because the networks of conscious agents are provably computationally universal. Anything you can build with uh, um, neural nets, you can build with networks of conscious agents, and they're beyond computation. It's easy to show that they actually, um, for technical reasons, are not limited to just computations. And what we found recently is that we have a mapping from the Markov dynamics of conscious agents um, down to decorated permutations. So this is a new contribution to mathematics that we published in January, where we show how Markov dynamics actually do map onto the same kinds of decorated permutations that the physicists have found. 
And then we, we now how, know how to take our decorated permutations and, and map them onto the decorated permutations of the physicists. So we now have a, a path from a theory of, of conscious agents outside of space-time to connect with the structures that the physicists have found outside of space-time. And that will allow us to then uh, map into, into space-time, physicists have already done that, and, and to predict scattering amplitudes. So this is the map that, we, this is the process we're proposing. Consciousness is fundamental. Space-time arises as a projection via decorated permutations, and so do particles. And we look to test this um, at a number of levels. One is um, inside the proton. So here, here's where the proton fits in, in the whole scheme of matter, and it has two up quarks and a down quark. And what we plan to do is look, uh, we, using our computational model, to actually model the, the, the momentum distributions of quarks and gluons inside protons at, uh, at, at, at various, at the at lower resolutions, there are three valence quarks that dominate, at slightly higher resolutions of, of temporal and spatial resolu resolution, you get uh, quark Cs and gluons, and at the highest resolutions, you get a, a sea of gluons. The, 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 the real particle data looks more like this. These are the momentum distributions, and our, our intent is to actually model these momentum distributions exactly using our theory of consciousness. So, so the idea is that, and, and you can, if you want, you can see some of the mathematics behind our, our models here in the, this paper, Fusions of Consciousness. So, so I'll just summarize and say, in, in summary, what we're, what we're doing is starting with consciousness and showing that space-time and particle physics arises. And then after we show that, then we can start to look at the neural correlates of consciousness in the brain. So I'll stop with, with that and thank several uh, people that have helped me. I would say just for this last bit, in, in particular, uh, Chouapon Chattopadier, um, who's a physicist at, at UC Berkeley, and uh, Ben Nepper, who's a, a physics student at, at, at Berkeley, and Chaitan Prakash and Robert Prentner, um, my, co my collaborators. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Donald. Do you want us to move into? Yes. Oh my gosh. Who wants to stand and stretch? I do. So everyone just get, get up and stretch a bit. It's a lot of sitting. And we were going to, yeah, take a break if you want. We could take a five minute break. We were going to move into um, questions for the panel for 30 minutes and then do a discussion. But I think we're just going to scrap the dis, um, the two things and we're just going to do a, a discussion and you can ask questions of the panel all in one. Hey, Jonathan, are you there? Yes. Can I just quickly ask you a question about your model? Because I don't think we're going to have time to do the panel thing. Sure. OK. And people are taking a break. You know how the I mean, you mentioned this multiple times about how there's these different conscious agents that are the nows. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really key. But, you know, so the auditory system, I wonder if I've even asked you this question before, but the auditory system has like a flick or fusion equivalent that's just much faster. So, so the flicker rate that you could detect in the auditory system is like on the millisecond level, but on the visual system, it's much longer. How do you basically deal with the binding problem when you have in the same moment? If, oh, if so the if, different. Yeah. The, yeah. So the, the idea would be that the um, there's an auditory window um, and then there's a visual window and the, each one of those windows is uh, binding at, uh, at different rates and then passing their information up to, to a higher level window. So you can have um, uh, different different flicker fusions for different systems that correspond to the different windows. Okay, but then how does the binding work? Because the resonance is, is based on the oscillation rate. So- Well, right? the, the, binding, the binding is happening at the individual uh, window level, but then that window is then uh, integrating up to the next level through cross-frequency coupling. All right, we're gonna have to sit down and figure this out. I, I need to understand that better. Okay, yeah, let's set up a, let's set up a chat, It'd be great. Cool, thanks. All right, so we're gonna open it up for questions. Okay. Oh yeah, and Christoph Koch had to um, run, he had to leave, unfortunately. He had something, so, sorry. Thank you so much for all these beautiful talks. Um, a lot of information to actually process. 
uh, very familiar with, uh, with Don Holtman's uh, book. Thanks for, for that book, beautiful. Uh, so I have multiple questions, but I'm, I'm gonna try to just do a couple of them. So at some point I actually did a neuro, uh, uh, neurophysiological studies in human cortex, and we were able to reproduce brain waves in a very tiny, very, very tiny piece of human brain. Uh, actually having cross-frequency coupling between layer five and layer two. Uh, and uh, my question literally is, how do you, well, two questions. First, how do you reconcile uh, the multiple window uh, uh, theory with cross-frequency coupling and the quantum theory? How information theory, quantum theory, and cross-frequency cross -frequency coupling could actually go together? First of all, and the second is, if uh, space and time is doomed, so what would be the next framework to actually try to move forward research in general? Uh, I could take a, a first uh, stab stab at that. Um, I, I think that um, the uh, the resonance that is uh, taking place uh, with respect to cross frequency uh, coupling. Uh, sort of remains to be uh, uh, determined, uh, and it's it's certainly possible that it would be uh, consistent with something that's uh, taking place uh, at the uh, at the quantum level. And and although uh, I'm not necessarily persuaded by uh, the, uh, the the role of uh, quantum effects in in consciousness, it it, it does seem uh, quite uh, plausible that uh, some of the uh, a really sort of uh, remarkable aspects of uh, quantum mechanics could be related to uh, some of the remarkable aspects of uh, of consciousness and in in other theorizing i've actually speculated that um one of the ways in which consciousness may uh, pertain to uh, physical uh, substrates is through there being additional uh, dimensions uh, of uh, physical reality. We've talked about uh, one dimension, three dimensions of space, actually they're, they're 10 or 11 according to, to string theory, but it seems plausible that there could also be multiple dimensions of time. And I speculated that there could be a, a subjective uh, dimension of time and also alternative time, which could potentially relate to the many worlds. And it's, it's possible that uh, thinking about multiple dimensions of uh, time uh, could uh, help to integrate some of the um, strange qualities of, of quantum mechanics. And Bernard Carr, a, a physicist uh, in England, has been also exploring this possibility. And, and I can address me a little about the, what's going on in physics when you say space-time is doomed and what's, what's beyond it. Um, so so the, the physicists in the last 10 years have said, we're looking for these, we're looking for structures beyond space-time. So they're, they're not just throwing up their hands and saying space-time is doomed, doy bay. They're actually going out there and saying, great, this is fun. Let's go find what's outside of space-time. And they're finding structures like the decorated permutations and the amplitudehedron. By the way, they're also saying that quantum theory is doomed. Quantum theory is not fundamental. Quantum theory itself, the, the weirdness of quantum theory, the no cloning theorem, uh, superposition, entanglement, and so forth, these are all symptoms of an interface, that space-time is just an interface. You can actually show that it's the lack of full information that leads to the no cloning theorem, that leads to entanglement and, and superposition. These are all just symptoms of an interface. So the physicists are finding structures where there are no Hilbert spaces. So it's, it's not that they're saying that, that quantum theory is doomed and they're not, they're not finding new stuff. They're finding new structures where there are no Hilbert spaces and therefore no quantum theory at all. And yet these structures give rise to unitary, local processes in space-time, namely particle scattering, from a completely new realm. So, but what, what's interesting is the physicists don't know what these things are, what, what it is about. They are just these mathematical structures now. So this is all brand new, last 10 years, literally just the last 10 years. They found these structures, they're static structures, there's no dynamics at all, and they don't know what, what it's about, but it works. So that's that's where we are in the science. And and so what, when I what I'm saying about the conscious agent dynamics is, the, the conscious conscious agents are outside of space time that that dynamics actually projects onto decorated permutations that's what we proved in January so we, that actually maps onto that 
And I'll just close with thing, a thing about time. The question came up about time. In the Markovian dynamics, there need be, outside of space-time, there need be no entropic arrow of time. The entropy of the Markovian dynamics can be constant. It doesn't increase. But if you take that dynamics, so it's reversible, you know, Markov dynamics, and you project it, uh, you lose any information in the projection at all, the projected dynamics will necessarily have an entropic arrow of time. So time is not at all an insight into the nature of reality. It's entirely an artifact of projection. It's no insight at all. And so time is the fundamental resource, the limiting resource in evolutionary theory, right? If you don't get food in time, you die. If you don't breathe in time, you die. If you don't mate in time, you don't reproduce. Time is the fundamental limited resource. So what this indicates is that that even the foundations of evolution of natural selection are artifacts of projection and not a deep insight into the nature of, of reality beyond space-time. So that leads to rather surprising conclusions. And um, I guess I would like to also address the question um, in two ways. One, I agree with what has already been said by both Jonathan and Donald that the, the way forward sort of, I'm just gonna summarize, the way forward in consciousness is to ask the questions both in physics and in experience um, that are emerging that, right now, and then to understand the relationship between them, right? So it, it, it doesn't do much good for a bunch of physicists to go off and say, we discovered these things beyond space time, because when people hear the word, I mean, I'm not Donald, and I know you're, that's not what you're saying. You're actually making the relationship with consciousness. That's not what you're saying. But when people hear, but we have to be careful because when people hear the words beyond space time, the subjective experience is there's space time, which is a box, and beyond space time is outside the box. Just like I drew in the indirect precognition model because how else am I gonna draw it, right? And so it's like, we're, we're, what I'm trying to say is we have to acknowledge that we're working with this fundamentally flawed system to try to figure out how this fundamentally flawed system actually works. And if we don't acknowledge the fundamental flaws, in communication about that system, investigation about that system, and, and interpretation of that system, um, we will fail. Dramatic, dramatic change had to happen, right? Because all the structures that we have in place is basically following the same fundamentally wrong preconceptions. A very interesting, stimulating evening. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I had at least 12 comments. I'll try and keep it down to three. <laughs> Maybe at variance with most of them. Although I must say Dr. Schooler's comments, I think I pretty much agreed with. Um, I, I, was, I was born and raised in San Francisco. I was there in the summer of love in 67, 68. All my friends were taking drugs. I wouldn't touch these things. I decided instead to study neuroscience and get into physiological psychology and understanding what was happening in the brainstem. I, I, a lot of people I worked with, I, I spent a summer in France studying with Michel Jouvet and sleep mechanisms in the brainstem. So I'm very interested in all these things. Um, but the, I, 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 went into, I gradually went into neuroscience from Berkeley, so I had a lot of experience at Berkeley with a whole lot of people with a lot of you know, very elevated minds, if you want to say, or expanded consciousnesses. Um, Certainly enjoyed it. I uh, went to UCLA, got very interested in temporal lobe epilepsy. I, I was involved in founding the Neuro Behavior Clinic at UCLA. We had, a lot, had several neuro, uh, temporal lobe epilepsy patients. It had a lot of very bizarre experiences. <clears throat> so I <clears throat> ended up deciding to go into psychiatry. So I'm an MD, PhD with a psychiatry background. Um, but I, so I did my PhD with Joaquin Fuster in the frontal lobes, and put, but I put my electrodes in the temporal lobes because at the same time as I was doing this, I was the chief resident and associate director of the geriatric psychiatry unit seeing lots and lots of Alzheimer patients. So trying to understand what memory mechanisms were. So we put our electrodes in the temporal lobe and to try to see if what was happening to units, not in an anesthetized monkey, but in a monkey who was actually performing a memory test, that was actually learning the things that he was seeing. And what we found is so, just in say some small billion neurons, say there's 100 billion neurons in the brain, so some little billion neuron segment that we were putting our electrodes in, for every stimulus, there were about half the neurons would respond. It was incredible. 
Some would respond to one thing, some to the other, sometimes they wouldn't respond. I had a, a, another friend, a, a Kichika Mikami, who was doing the same thing with the temporal lobe, but looking at many different objects, and about half of the neurons responded to every object. So if you do the mathematics, you then realize that if you've got 100 billion neurons in the brain, the number of ways that you can see the world is two to the 100 billionth power, which is way more than any physicist would ever think about. Because, you know, once they get to about two to the hundredth power, that's all the particles in the universe. So the physicists don't go anywhere close to what the neuroscientists have to deal with. So two to the hundred billionth power is the capacity of your brain to, to process things. So this is, I, in 1984, I was a finalist for the Lindsley Prize. And, but Robert Sapolsky won it. He recently came out and said there's no such thing as free will. And I think that's a bunch of baloney, because you got, more power than the whole universe in your, in your consciousness. Now, you can divide your consciousness by doing a split brain thing like Sperry did, or different areas of the brain, you can get strokes and lose parts of your consciousness, sure enough. So consciousness can be divided, but, but your, your job is to keep your consciousness together and organized and help deal with the problems of the world. That's what we've evolved to do. Now, you take, uh, you know, to go a step beyond that, there was a book by Carl Sagan called The Dragons of Eden which I'd read through and I thought that was the most terrible thing because you know, he said it's all in the brainstem. Well, I've, I've actually had an epiphany that he was right. It is all in the brainstem. We've evolved from the dragons of Eden. Our brainstem manages all of our energy and all of our intentions, but you've got this incredible supercomputer that can think things through, that can perceive things, that can perceive just essentially an infinite number of things. I mean, the, I'd, say, I'd say, you know, two to the hundred billionth power, but that's just using, you know, every, every millisecond. But really, things are, are much more a, a qualitative than a quantitative number. So you really have an infinite capacity. And once you realize that you have an infinite capacity, but we have limits. Um, I would like to be, you know, what's free will? I am not Superman. I cannot jump over tall buildings with a single bound. But I can make a decision as whether or not to look at this friend of mine sitting next to me or not look at him. So I have free will. I can make decisions. But things are complicated. And I'm going to leave it at that. Things are complicated. Thank you very much for tolerating me. That's hard to disagree with. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. That's beautiful. I really appreciate that. Uh, good evening. This has been a truly fascinating thing. Uh, <coughs> As you can see, I'm not new to the planet, but I'm new to the consciousness world here, so to speak. I've always been interested in it. And where I'm, what I'm really doing now is kind of asking for help for the new guy. So uh, I'd like to eventually get back to the original propositions that were laid out in the first two parts of the discussion. So disclosure here, I'm a systems engineer. Uh, I'm a closet philosopher and notionally a nascent mystic. So uh, we'll see where all that goes, right, as I start looking at this consciousness stuff. But one of the things that, given where I come from, I look at it from a systems perspective, okay? And so many great things were talked about, but as I'm listening, I'm trying to synthesize it enough where I can grab hold of what I think the concept of consciousness we're after is. And for me, it gets to something, not definition, I, I question the definition. Uh, I challenged it a little bit, but I'll go with a concept that has two definitions that need to be defined within it, right? So for me, it's kind of a, a life, I'll say it this way, a life-driven system uh, organizing information to enable thought in context. So what the hell does that mean? You know, in, in my mind, what it means is I think we, and we, a lot of the discussion here was talking about the different uh, levels from the now, from other models and different things like that. But for me, I see it as a several tiers at a minimum. One is an individual cognitive level. That's how we subjectively think what consciousness is. Uh, and I think our subjectivity is totally, not totally, but largely non-subjective in a lot of ways because of the second level is a group collaborative level of consciousness. You can look at it as a socio-cultural interaction. In this room, I'm in a context that is affecting my awareness, which is affecting my perception, which is affecting my processing of who the hell am I in this room? You know, and, and who the hell are these other people I'd never met before? You know, so that kind of group collaborative consciousness has a feedback loop into the individual cognitive. And then there's a higher order, and I don't know the words for it. Words are very important, but I don't have them for where I'm at in my journey right now. But the third level in my mind is this collective integrative 
level. I mean, that's some grandiose scheme, the holy hand wave of whatever this universal or beyond universal or multi-universal uh, consciousness might be. And I see a, an interaction there. I see a set of feedback loops. I see a set of growth on each of those levels that are mutually dependent in some way. And there may be other levels. There might be other aspects to it. But as I notionalize this concept, uh, I, I'm wrestling with what does it mean, you know, and ultimately, like I used to get at work, uh, recently retired, so I don't have to worry about getting this question all the time now, but so what, you know, what do I do about that? And for me, it's like, when I die, is there something, you know? So this gets back to those first things that were being talked about. Some of the things you mentioned, dream state, you talked about uh, precognition, you talked about a lot of these other psi aspects, and I think a lot of times when people say psi, they're heard as, that's some woo-woo stuff, shut up, go sit down, stinking in color, you know? Um, but I think there's aspects, I think, based on the data you collected early with the hand, you know, the hand raising of who's had an experience, I think most of us have had it, but we're afraid to talk about it. Um, so where I'm going with all this is ultimately to a, a real question, you know, where's the data? Is it the data that we have that we're used to? Is it just science? As let me, again, full disclosure, when I hear science, I hear curiosity. I hear an esoteric, almost, concept of a quest for learning something. When I see science, I don't see that, okay? Um, what I often see is, in any field, in DOD where I've been working many years, <laughs> uh, a lot of times it gets to be about uh, waiting for the dinosaur to die for change to happen, okay? Uh, or when the dinosaur, in the military, in uniform, dies, he goes and becomes a contractor, he's got to wait for two dinosaurs to die. So whatever the Jurassic to whatever period we're talking about. But the point is, change just doesn't happen quick, and it shouldn't always happen quick. But the openness of mind has to be essential. And that's not just in science and engineering. Uh, so where I see a, a spectrum again now is uh, the relationship, and I've seen some of the things I've been reading lately. Uh, you know, you look at science, it's kind of like the the here now, the materialist perspective. You know, that's what we are subject to. Uh, second level, I'll use that philosophical level, which is what could it mean? What is the nature of it? What is the thing uh, that it brings meaning to me, you know, or to a group or to the universe, whatever we want to call those words. Again, words are problematic for me right now. And the last is this mystical thing. Uh, which is somebody purports to have this mystical experience that me and God are brothers, you know, and we're, we're hanging out together on Thursdays, you know, he likes hamburgers, I like hot dogs, okay, whatever, okay. But that's where sometimes the woo-woo comes in. And I don't think there's woo-woo anymore. Uh, I, I think there's too many dimensions of experience across so many people. And I know anecdotes are probably not the best data source, but maybe that's where the data is, you know, in some of those things. How do we reconstruct those environments to understand that because we can't instrument it, because we can't necessarily reproduce it. We can't reproduce a meteor, by the way, okay? But once it's burned, it's gone. So you, we can look for the behaviors, we can look for the essential elements. So I'm wondering if there's patterns. So I'm, a pattern, I'm an architect in my head. You know, what are the patterns? What are the elements? How do you represent it? What are the forms, functions, fits? What are the relationships? How do these change? But again, I always come back to the context. So when I'm talking about all this stuff, every one of us dreams, at least once. You know, My wife tells me that, in some, she says I hardly ever dream, but when I dream, I, if it's a scary job, I can control it. And I, I listened to uh, Dr. Savani's, uh, one of her podcasts, and you know, she talks a little bit about you know, lucid dreaming. You know, which is a new concept to me. But uh, the idea of it is, is there. You know, so some people can go in there and can control it. Is that some kind of a psi, or is that some kind of a metaphysical, or is that some kind of a physics-based approach? Is it just a, you know, a meat matter, <laughs> the wetware between our ears? So uh, a long rambling thing. I'm excitable like a little kid when it comes to this stuff. Uh, I'm amazed at some of the thinking that's going on here. I'm excited to take a disciplined approach to going through my stack, you know, 15 feet high books. Uh, I appreciate the resources that have been presented, the links, but I'll throw this at you as the question. How do we reconceptualize data? And what does that mean? You know, there, there's 
the data collection, there's the analysis. Somewhere in between analysis and assessment, there's an evaluation. Is it a quantitative? Is it a qualitative? Is it, you know, what does data mean in this realm? It's different. It's fundamentally different. So thanks again to all of you. Thank you for being here. Okay. Julia's going to respond, but I want to say thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. I also agree. Um, this is a good representation of how many people are coming into the field. Uh, your, your story. And by the way, the DOD thing is not nothing. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting to me that the most sort of open-minded of uh, folks um, interested in this kind of thing are from DOD, and that's because the applications. So they're less, con so any organization that's less concerned about how something works and more concerned about does it work and what can we do with it that's gonna help save our soldiers, um, they're clearly gonna care about uh, the data, but the data that they're asking about, this answers your data structure question, the data that they're asking about are the data that have to do with how can we apply it, right? So that's one way you can structure, reconceptualize data is to say, okay, these things seem to be happening. How do we show that this application works before and after using the application? How have we improved some process? So that's one way to reconceptualize data. Another way to reconceptualize it is to say, it really matters what people's personal experiences are. We're actually, there was a paper that came out this year talking about how actually people generally don't lie about their experiences, especially if it's a stigmatized experience, especially if they know they're not gonna get special attention for it and go on TV or something. So in fact, just asking people for spontaneous experiences is another way to reconceptualize data. And then finally, there's the original way, or finally in this sort of brief conversation, there's the original way of scientifically um, creating controlled experiments, which is what we do in the case of precognition. It's easy to run a precognition experiment in a laboratory or even online, and I've done both, and many people have done both, because all you're doing is measuring something, and then in the future, you're using a random number generator to present something, and then you're looking at, is there a correlation between the thing you measured before the random number generator selected something and the future thing? And if there is, that suggests some form of precognition, right? So that doesn't even have to be reconceptualized. You just run the experiment and you look at the result. So it seems to me you can include, like you have an umbrella of data, and in that, right, you have these different application-based, um, spontaneous, subjective experience-based, and controlled experiment-based information, and you use those in different ways, but they work together to produce a conclusion. Quick response to that, to elaborate a little bit, is you talk about the people that are coming out with their experience. One, there's those that won't. One, there's those that won't talk about it, so you'll never get that data because of the stigma. Two, I think there's an altruistic aspect to some of those that do come out because they want to reveal the truth and they're on an honest quest to say, I just saw some crap I don't understand. What the heck was that all about? You know, and if it's got a threat to it, oftentimes it doesn't. It's just got an uneasiness. It's different. I, I don't know what I'm dealing with. You know, somebody help me. Uh, so that's a consciousness dimension of its own self, that the quest to understand aberrations and things. Uh, the other thing within DOD, we have to be careful. I love DOD. I have them served in uniform and uh, in support of. That said, there's a lot of nuggets in there that just uh, don't have a openness to larger thinking. So it, there's a phrase that is used oftentimes, not just there, but every in a lot of places, Kiss, the kiss principle, keep it simple, stupid. My corollary to that is don't kiss, don't keep it stupidly simple, you know? I think Einstein had to quote along those lines. So we have to be able to communicate and apply it in relatively elegant or at least simplistic terms. But what I was getting at with the question about the data is what is it intrinsically that may be different and what we consider data? Those outliers, I think it was you that actually talked about, what are these, and I love this notion of the, uh, what was it at large, the, uh, the entanglement at large. And that gets back to those three levels I was talking about and maybe others, but I, I didn't want to keep yabbering too much. But you know, the, the point I'm, I'm after here though, I appreciate your answer to that, but that's the danger I see, was immediately go to what's the applied aspect of this. 
there's no money for basic, basic, basic thoughtful research, you know, and, and we need to get that figured out. I mean, I don't really, there's a lot of these institutes and stuff, where's that money coming from? You know, you need a Bigelow or somebody like that just throwing money at it? I don't know. It's not yeah. a lot of money, and, no, and the answer is no, Bigelow throws money science, at his own projects. Yes, I, it's very limited, partly from the stigma. The other thing I wanted to respond to your response is it would be um, irresponsible f for me not to point out that, um, and some of the information that comes from people who are telling you their experiences is coming from path pathology, right? So it's not the case that everything that everyone has experienced is, is accurately reported, um, and we already know that our perceptions are, as Donald was just talking about, sort of a dashboard into reality and there's pathology and that doesn't mean everyone who has these experiences is pathological so it has to there has to be nuance in the discussion hi uh, Jim Salentano I'm an emergency physician and a biophysicist I study ion channel so I'm also a newbie when it comes to the whole consciousness thing um, I was really struck by the comment uh, that uh, the brain is designed or evolved to uh, solve life and death problems. And for the last several years, I've been working off the idea that the most fundamental concept in all of science is not quantum mechanics or relativity. They're really cool. They're, to me, just distractions. The most important concept in all of science is entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. And when you talk about life and death, what are you talking about? You're talking about overcoming the tendency to high entropy. If you're talking about language, it's low entropy. If you're talking about creating communities, it's low entropy. If you're talking about solving problems, it's creating the low entropy of ideas. And I've been trying to, for, to promote this idea that that's what we really go for whenever we try to solve problems. We get distracted by black and white thinking, we get distracted by this dichotomous, I'm right, you're wrong, we're great, they suck, all this kind of stuff. And I've been toying with the idea for many years that the brain evolved to sense, predict, and respond to changes in entropy. That that's what it's really doing, that's really why we have brains, that's really why it helps us survive. So that said, um, Dr. Hoffman, I have learned a lot from you today about physics, I mean, I. I'm happy that space time is dead. I want your thoughts on two things. First, any, any insights into the fine structure constant? Did we finally figure that one out? And then also there's this it from bit idea, this idea that the fundamental building block or, or whatever that fundamental thing is, is actually information. So as I was listening to you, I was wondering about that too. So I'd love any thoughts you have on that as well. Right. So. First, on your comments about ent entropy, it, it's interesting that um, physicists uh, like Leonard Susskind have recently discovered what he calls the second law of quantum complexity. That uh, it, and it says that the complexity of a quantum system always grows to its maximum. So that's, that's it's, it's it's quite interesting. They're using that to understand the the inner workings of of black holes. Um, the fine structure constant. We we have some hints. Um, we with these Markov kernels and the Markov dynamics, we, we're positing right now that the, the Markov kernels that have zero entropy rates, which are like the periodic ones, uh, correspond to massless particles like photons. And, and so, so now that we have what we think are the correlates of the conscious correlates of photons, you know, we can then start to look at the fine structure constant, which is, you know, the, the, the strength of the electromagnetic interactions. And so, so yeah, I actually think that we'll be able to show where the fine structure constant comes from out of the actual uh, dynamics of conscious agents beyond space time. So not just a hand wave, we're, we're, we're actually hoping to predict exactly the fine structure constant and perhaps how it changes with scale and so forth in a time. Um, but entropy being fundamental it certainly is fundamental in our space-time headset. I mean, that, that's, that, that we all know. If, if you don't take care of things, they fall apart, including our bodies and so forth. So that, that absolutely rules in our, in our headset. But it, I'm suggesting that that's an artifact of our headset having limited information, as is quantum theory. Quantum theory is merely an artifact of having limited information in a headset. So quantum theory is the mathematics to describe 
a headset that has limited information. But our dynamics of consciousness need not be governed by entropy increases. Not at all. It's, it's easy to write down Markovian dynamics that, that have no increase in entropy. But I, I, I'll just close on a complexity. Someone uh, earlier uh, person talked about complexity. It, it turns out that the all the set of all possible Markov chains of, on just like, and if you have 50 colors that you can see, it'd be a Markov chain in 50 states of the colors that you could see. Of course, we can see 7 million, so the, 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 but just take 50. The number of vertices on the on the Markov polytope, which is the space, the, the polytope that describes all the possible Markov chains, the number of vertices for just 50 colors is 10,000 times larger than the number of particles in the known universe. And so, so this theory of consciousness is not simple. The mathematics explodes um, ex literally exponentially. <clears throat> I'd like to make another comment if you don't mind. I'd like to make another comment if you don't mind. Um, so, George Engel, 1977, has this concept of the biopsychosocial model, which is a good engineering model to sort of pull it all together, and I think it really does. But um, I think one of the most fundamental laws of the universe that we have to obey is the Gompertz law. 1825, Benjamin Gompertz went to the London Zoo and found that the, in, the rate of increase of mortality doubled every certain number of years for every species. And we are just a continuum of that. Our, our length of, of uh, doubling is uh, 7.5 years uh, for women and 8.2 years for men. You're gonna, your mortality increases exponentially. And so before I learned this, I was trying to figure out how I could live forever. And I finally realized that this was a this was a barrier that I could not get beyond. So, but mm -hmm. I finally did figure out how to live forever. And that's you've got to live through ever, not through your children, but through your grandchildren. That's the real secret. And so about your space-time continuum, there's not enough of either, so forget it. <laughs> okay, so when I was nine years old, I had a near-death experience. I drowned as a child. I was gone for about three minutes. And ever since then, I feel like I'm trapped here and so I feel empathy for anything that might be trapped in a brain and the first time I read an article about cerebral organoids being grown around the world in labs my first concern was to find out if there was anything happening so I went to college for the first time four years ago <laughs> and I'm on a quest to treat cerebral organoids or any kind of cell culture neurons in a dish as if it's just a severely disabled person. It doesn't have a body. I think we need to hook them up to sensory input, cameras, microphones, sense of touch. We need to give them motor output and we need to engage with them for a year just in case they learn how to interact. It takes a baby about a year to tell you it wants a banana. It's these organoids people maybe are looking for some things here or there but for a week but for a month who learns a language in that amount of time who learns how to interact i think it would be wonderful if these are just cell cultures in a dish that's my hope but responsibly i think we need to verify that what do you think Um, or so just a background organoids are these um, uh, sort of supposedly chaotic but actually self-organizing um, uh, mini brains that aren't organized like the human brain that are grown in a dish and so the question is like they're used to tr they're, they're used to investigate the edge the edge cases so what can this strange non um, evolved structure a biological structure tell us about how the brain works, how the mind works. Can't tell us anything about how the mind works because it's <laughs> there's no subjective reporting. Um, but how, what can it tell us about the brain work? Is it brain how the brain works? And to me, so first I want to say thanks for sharing about your experience. Um, I also have felt very trapped in space time. I call this space time, um, just because my childhood experiences of floating around in non non space time, I guess. And so I'm very sympathetic with the, the, the constraint of, of being trapped or being kind of held down. Um, and 
And I think that that's the same question we need. I, mean, I just want to broaden the question. I just want to highlight the question and say it's not ridiculous. And also broaden the question that we ought to be doing this with AI, right? We, I mean, if we're, if we're going to walk around and claim that we're allowed to use AI however we want to, um, you know, we ought to be doing this with animals. I'm not saying that animal rights, I, you know, I agree with everything that animal rights activists say, or there should be no animal testing or any of those things. I'm just saying, like, in order to understand the ethical situation, we have to probe it so we can find out what the ethical situation is and then make decisions about what our response will be. But you can't have an ethical response to something unless you know what's true about it. So I agree with you. Yeah, again, thank you. Um, a lot of excellent experience in the room um, and great knowledge. Um, so I'm a budding neuroscientist. I'm a, a second year PhD student. I have a background in psychology and uh, neurolinguistics. Um, and kind of going through the process, you know, I got into uh, reading and writing a lot, and they say that poetry is the language of consciousness. So I started doing a lot of just like journaling, journaling and poetry and stuff like that. And then it kind of led to a lot of synchronicities. Um, and hopefully this doesn't take like a, a cynical nihilistic kind of turn. Um, but one of the things like dealing with the language community and also the, the consciousness community, which you guys kind of touched on was there is a lot of toxicity where it's like you might talk to somebody about having these alternative perspectives and they just kind of turn away and they scoff at you and all these things. And it's as Descartes says, you know, I know that I know nothing. The more that I'm learning, I'm realizing that there's so much out there that like, we don't really understand. And um, <clears throat> kind of taking, you know, there's the, the dualism and monism, there's mysterianism where it's saying that you can take the physical and kind of reduce it down, but consciousness is one of those things that maybe we just don't have uh, a faculty to ever understand it. The, the same way an armadillo doesn't have the capacity to understand calculus. So hearing all these things about the doom of all these theories is consciousness doomed? Like, are we ever going to be able to actually figure it out? Or is it just the brain trying to figure out the brain where we're enjoying the process, where we're, we're going through the steps and we're not ever going to get to the destination, but we're just loving the journey, you know? So I, I love the questions that we're asking. I love that we're coming up with new methodology, methodologies to answer these questions. But like, is, is consciousness doomed in that sense? And kind of tailing off from that, um, talk about like precognition and all the theories that are coming out. What is the role of like intuition? I know we mentioned it maybe one time today, intuition, but I feel like when it comes to these theories, like there is this intuitive feel that like this is the right route. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd be happy to take a, a first pass uh, at that question. I think it's always a, uh, or it can be a mistake to try to think of understanding as, do we understand it yet? Do we understand it yet? Sort of imagining that there's a, a final destination where we'll completely understand things. And rather than thinking of it as a final destination, thinking of it as a process. And I think, um, I think that it's very likely that we will continue to make progress in understanding consciousness, that uh, we, we can uh, act ask uh, tractable questions and uh, begin to make up uh, real uh, empirical evidence. We can also identify alternative uh, possible ways of uh, accounting for extant evidence and, and introduce different models. And that these are genuine progress, even if there will never be a time where we have it entirely worked out. I think that's true about many aspects of reality, that it's always going to be uh, continuing to discover new things. And, and personally, I think that's a good thing. I think that uh, it would be a, a boring world if we just sort of had it all worked out. And so the, the opportunity to continue asking new questions and, and making progress on them is, 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 is very valuable. So I, I, I think that there, in a certain sense, mysterianism has a foundation in the sense that there may be certain things that we never get uh, fully resolved, but I think that uh, we should continue with the, what seems to be the evident uh, process of ever increasing understanding. 
I agree with Jonathan, and I I would just add a little side note, and that is that when you look at what what is a scientific theory, it, it, what you do is you say if you grant me these assumptions, then I can explain all this fun stuff. But I'm not explaining the assumptions that those are the miracles of my theory. And every scientific theory has its assumptions, which are its miracles. And I might say, well, of course, I can get you a deeper theory that explains those assumptions. Sure. But your new theory has its own assumptions. And so it's in the nature of scientific explanation that there will never, ever, in principle, be a theory of everything, not in physics, not in consciousness, not anywhere. So we have infinite job security in science. I agree quite a bit with what Jonathan and oh sorry there you go um, I agree quite a bit with what Jonathan and, and Donald just said. It feels like if we if we weren't talking about this then maybe it would be doomed. But we're talking about it. Finally, it took a while, but we're here. <laughs> and I think Mona also brought up about the psychedelic renaissance. I think you're going to see quite a bit more people having experiences and wanting to understand them. So it might be that the way that we've been approaching consciousness studies is maybe not the same anymore, and maybe that has to change. But I'd be really surprised if people were not interested in this question. It feels like it's actually, well, from my perspective, it feels like it's actually finally starting to get some traction, which is great. I love that you asked the question about intuition. I can only share from, from my perspective what it feels like. And a perspective, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I feel like it's important to say, a perspective is only a way of looking at something, right? Your perspective of me is different than his perspective of me. It's not right or wrong. It's just a way of seeing things. So intuition comes from, from my perspective, comes from that entanglement at large space, that eel space. And it plays an incredibly important role if we're able to listen to it. But one of the challenges is that we're... We're not really that great at listening. Little kids are really good at listening, actually. I mean, not to us, but to that. <laughs> so um, if you think back to when you were a child, you kind of always had an intuitive sense of what you could or couldn't do, for example, where you should or shouldn't go, for the most part, right? It's a pretty blanket statement. But as we get older and we have these fears that come in, those fears block a lot of that intuition. So from, from my perspective, I feel like intuition is is one of the most powerful things that we could access if we could quell some of the spinning that we have often in our minds. That's just my perspective. I, do you want, I do wanna? Um, I just wanted to uh, comment on the, the part about interacting with others who um, might be dismissive. <laughs> so, cause I was just giving a talk this past weekend and I thought about this a lot, and I, and I, uh, I kind of had to... So part of the reason I included in this talk all that stuff about, um, you know, we can't, we can't put each other down anymore. Like, this, it kind of has to end. And I just put it in the... Really, that should be true for everything. I should go to a political rally and say that, whatever. <laughs> but in this context, it's like, okay, we'll use the psychedelic renaissance, because it is happening. Um, I mean, you're going to watch more and more neuroscientists, especially new PhD students, come in, they're interested in it, they're going to go in, they're going to read, uh, go outside of the, you know, neuro, the assigned reading and find a lot of weird shit in the psychedelic literature and you're going to have questions. So that's happening. But anyway, so it, like, it's a personal thing. Um, so it's, to me, it's a, it's a personal thing and then it's also a social thing. So like a social thing, I'm... I address by saying, hey, like, we all need to talk about it. There's stigma around this, just like there was stigma, or probably still is, around mental health. But the more people share their stories, you know, the, the more you can get over that. But the personal aspect, and this one's harder, but that's, the, that's like the psychological work you have to do. So when I had this um, flip and I wrote this book, I was like in tears on the floor in the bathroom, like, oh my God, my colleagues are going to think I'm crazy. And... Um, it took a lot of shadow work, whatever you want to call it, psychological questioning to be like, what am I so afraid of, right? Or like, what, what experience from my past makes me feel like um, to tell somebody I am spiritual or 
believe in precognition is going to threaten my being because that's what it felt like. Like I felt threatened. Um, so I had to like do that and it took a lot of work. It's internal work, but that's, if everyone did that, you wouldn't have such a hard time. People, when you tell someone something and they roll their eyes at you, you don't give a shit because you're like, they have their own stuff. They, they just haven't read what I've read. We don't have the same data set and it's really not a big deal. Um, I mean, but that's why I'm saying there's two aspects because people shouldn't be rolling their eyes at you. Like that's the world hopefully we move towards but we're not in that world yet. So you have to do the internal work so it doesn't bother you. And I guess I'll just bring up the end and say two things. One, um, what I've found um, personally that got me through that era in my life of crying on the floor and what are my colleagues gonna think of me is to recognize um, the ways in which academia is a cult and um, that actively uses suppression to um, reduce discussion of things that are considered inappropriate at that particular time. And to study cults a little bit and see, okay, so it's a cult. So how do I deprogram myself? You know, so, so asking that question, how do I work with other people to get deprogrammed who aren't in the cult? And when you tell them stories about what happens in the cult, they're like, that's so crazy, and you're like, I know, it's a cult. So <laughs> that's one piece of it. And then the other piece, that thing that helped me get through that piece, and all the anger and frustration of that, is beginning to understand that unconditional love is the most powerful force in the universe. And that, uh, and then I started studying it. And one of the things I learned, and this brings us back to intuition, is that when people are in a state of unconditional love, which we defined through a, a survey that I think might be the only unconditional love survey in the world, um, they can actually perform significantly better on precognition tasks than when they're not in that state. In other words, their capacity to predict future events that are created by a random number generator, so therefore should not be predictable, is significantly higher when they're in a state of unconditional love. So it's this, recognition of that's what can pop you out of this space-time trap. That's what can pop you out of the sort of trap of your own um, story. That's what gets you out of sort of the cult of, of perception almost because uh, we need things that pop us out of that. So I think I call that intuition. I'd like to add just one little point if I could. Um, and, and that is that I, I, I'm actually quite um, sanguine about the future of consciousness first research uh, because I think it's true that consciousness is fundamental and physics is not space time is not I think that that's true and when we actually get mathematically precise models which demonstrate that and show that we can make predictions that the physicalist model can't then we will have converts from the phys phys physicalist camp in droves because we'll be able with our theories to do something that they cannot possibly do with their theories and so my attitude is, I mean, I have lots of colleagues who are are justifiably um, not impressed with the state of consciousness research because their attitude is, uh, where's the beef? What what theory do you have that can predict and then you, whatever physical process you want, you know, scattering amplitudes, what, 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 what can you, where's the beef? If there's no beef, there's nothing for them to, to as, as scientists, to, to even consider. So, but I think we'll have the beef probably very, very soon. And we'll have mathematically precise theories that will have uh, explanatory power that goes well beyond physicalist theories and then watch them turn in droves. And, um, and, and, and by the way, you know, my colleagues who are physicalists working on, on consciousness, they're brilliant. These are, these are geniuses. Um, the only reason they're not making progress is not because they're, they're, they're dumb, they're, they're geniuses. It's because they're physicalists and physicalism is the wrong framework. When, you, when we unleash them from that framework and, and, and set their creativity going on, on the new direction, watch out, we, we won't be able to keep up. So I'm actually quite sanguine for the future of, of consciousness research. Hi, thank you so much for this wonderful event. I'm so appreciative of the work that you guys are all doing and, and bringing people together like this. Um, hi, Julia. Um, you know, I want to just expand on that. I can't think of how many times I've recommended uh, Dr. Hoffman's work in the case against reality. I find this, this line of research 
really to be very important. So with that said, um, this was a very Western-centric conversation. And I just want to make a quick comment that, you know, there was a lot of objective exploration of the subjective, uh, you know, that was presented on tonight. And I think that's worthwhile. However, I think it's also important to remember that there are literally thousands of years, millennia of cultures that were frankly wholly oriented around exploring notions of the ultimate nature of reality and how consciousness relates to that. And allow me to suggest, you know, through a subjective approach to subjectivity, they made an awful lot of progress. There's, there's a lot of meat there. Um, I saw a, an interesting conversation between Dr. Hoffman and uh, Swami Sarva Priyananda the other day. I will say, Dr. Hoffman, I thought you were a little dismissive of Swamiji and kind of these old books, right? Like, you know, okay, I appreciate that, you know, a, a mathematically precise understanding of consciousness would be extremely useful and would take those notions further, perhaps. But I'm also going to just put out as a suggestion there's a lot there to be explored, and there is so much that I think could come of greater collaboration between kind of Western consciousness researchers and, and some folks who I think mm. have a lot that would be useful to what you all are doing, but it would take for everyone here, I think, to really be willing to listen and maybe even read the texts and try to understand them and take advantage of you know, people in religious studies departments uh, like Dr. Tomalsana in um, San Diego, um, who is, you know, an expert in Trika Shaivism. And, you know, people like that, I think, will also contribute to this work tremendously. And I just encourage you all to take advantage of those collaboration opportunities. Yeah. Which one? Tess? Oh my God, you're right. Okay, um, yes. So earlier this year, we, it was this year, right? Yes. Um, we did a science and spirituality retreat at the University of Puget Sound. Actually, one of the attendees of our event last year um, was inspired to organize it and host us, and we sort of helped. And um, yeah, and it was that. It was um, in conjunction with their theology, compared religious philosophy. I don't know exactly what their department was called, but one of those. Um, religious thought and philosophy, probably. Um, it was with them, so we had a bunch of, we had like, we had, we had mystics, we had um, professors of theology and philosophy, we had neuroscientists. It was, a, it, was a, it was a great mix, who else was there? Yeah, and anyway, so we're aware, we're definitely aware. Um, I mean, in my book I talked about that, I said science needs to bridge with the humanities. Um, that Jeff Kripal, who connected Allison and I, actually is the chair of um, philosophy and religious thought at Rice University, and I completely agree with you. And I think, um, I think it's just when you're coming from science, we sometimes tend to forget, like in our science events. Um, but yeah, it's worth keeping in mind. So thank you for making that comment. Hi. Hi. Um, first of all, a quick thank you to the organizers. Thank you so much. This has uh, been wonderful. And the presenters um, for your contributing your time. Uh, I come to this uh, gathering as a, I guess you would say a lay person, um, not a scientist. Um, uh, do a lot of work in as a collective liberation activist is how I show up in the world primarily. Um, a couple of quick comments and uh, the idea of academia as a cult. I have kind of unusual set of experiences as an, as an undergraduate at a, at a big research university. I got my fill of academia and left and then came back as an administrator for a long time and I exited it and because that, that experience of the cult is like really powerful, that really resonated. Thank you for that. And if folks haven't, aren't familiar with um, Mark Fisher's book, Exiting the Vampire Castle, highly recommended <laughs> on this topic. Um, I guess coming from, to coming to this topic, you know, hearing all this amazing work, it really kind of quickens my mind. It's, it's exciting, and I'm glad I made the effort to be here, I, to travel to be here. Um, what I feel like I can contribute is 
the idea as a, as, a, as a social justice activist that where consciousness is demonstrably present, that a recognition, as, as a broad strokes definition of like unified um, uh, self-awareness, right? Something like that. Um, that. That beings that demonstrate uh, unified uh, consciousness, um, psychological presence, sense of self, um, are members of the moral community, and they have to be respected for that, um, meaning that they, to, the respect for their bodily integrity. And, you know, um, so when I say collective liberation activists, a big part of that is animal justice activism. Um, and I just want to share uh, a, a quick passage that folks may or may not be aware of. If they're not, I hope um, they take it to heart. Um, this is the, um, a statement on the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness from um, July of 2012. So the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness was written by Philip Lowe and edited by Young Poncep, Diana Reese, David Edelman, Bruno Van Swinderen, Philip Lowe, and Christopher Koch. Uh, the declaration was publicly, publicly proclaimed in Cambridge, UK on July 7, 2012 at the Francis Crick Memorial Conference on Consciousness in Human and Non-Human Animals at Church Hill College, University of Cambridge by Lowe, Edelman, and Koch. The declaration was signed by the conference participants that very evening in the presence of Stephen Hawking in the Balfour Room at the Hotel Duvin in Cambridge, UK. The Declaration concludes with this passage. We declare the following. The absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude any organism from experience, experiencing affective states. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of consciousness, conscious states along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds, and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates. So, um, respectfully, um, when, I, when I hear people say, well, question animal justice and animal rights activists, um, take on things like experimenting on animals. Um, I reject that, I challenge that all day, every day. And if anyone wants to come and talk to me about that, I am available. It's what I do in the world and it's what I bring to these spaces because um, I'll just ask people who, who might, there may be people in this room that engage in animal expectation and if there's a cost benefit analysis equation that has people saying, well, it's worth it, ask if it would be worth it if it was you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can, can I just make a, a brief comment, which is that uh, I definitely uh, think that uh, animals are, are, are conscious. So we have a, a paper in Perspective of Psychological Science that talks about that. But I think we also have to recognize that it's uh, very possible that consciousness keeps going down uh, and that uh, we shouldn't necessarily assume that it's uh, limited um, to um, the class of individuals uh, that you were referring to. I think it is uh, it is plausible that insects are conscious. I think it's plausible that uh, single-celled organisms are conscious. I think it's uh, plausible that uh, 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 even even cell, you know, mitochondria uh, could be could be conscious. Uh, plants could well uh, experience unconsciousness. So that also raises, you know, the concern, you know, for protecting all all things that are potentially conscious, you know, none of us could eat. Um, so I just want to point that out. I, of course, that's a bit of a straw man argument. Clearly animals are conscious. Plants may be, and that's, I, I, I challenge that the statement as a way, it's, it's a appeal to futility fallacy, and I challenge that. I don't think he I'm not sure he can hear you without a mic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard. Oh, you heard him? Okay. Oh, well, that's good. You hear great. Thanks. Cool. You've got a good voice. We, since we only have a few minutes left, I'd like to go ahead. I just want to let everybody know we've got maybe five, six minutes left. Who's next? Okay. Hi. Uh, hi. Thanks. Uh, turtles all the way down, indeed. Um, 
well, yeah, the universe being made of mental states that rhymes with panpsychism, but that, that's a, a diversion. Uh, my question is about neurodiversity. And uh, I was struck, uh, Julia, by your, your um, statement earlier that you know, not even the most um, empirically minded among us, including statisticians, seem to be moved by data and that, uh, that experience is really what moves people. And uh, you know, given that the, the diversity of experiences that we've all had, um, you know, what are ways, most effective ways that we can show up in the world to not convince others, but maybe to um, create the space for a possibility of a shift or an evolution in consciousness where, you know, essentially, you know, how do we make um, curiosity uh, contagious? You know, how do we create a bit of, you know, uh, humility about what else is possible and about, you know, our convictions, what we know? Um, in a way that creates the space for you know others who have had their other trajectories through culture and space time and have their own Markov blankets and, and, and are close to all these ideas. How, how can we just create that little that little possibility? But but then I guess also do so in a way that is rigorous at the same time. It seems like a kind of kind of a paradox. You know how to relate authentically to people um, and do so in a way that you know validates everybody's experience, but then also, you know, be able to, to stand by, you know, the scientific method is a valid way of navigating, you know, at least some, um, you know, dimension of, um, of our intersecting realities. Well, I could say just two things and then one is host an event like this and then two is share your experiences. <laughs> and I'll say three is to make an intention to work towards being in a state of unconditional love, which includes unconditional love for yourself and unconditional love for others. And um, it is not just unconditional acceptance, like I unconditionally accept your perspective. That's, um, that's the booby prize. That's like an intellectual trick. It's, a, it's a, an emotional motivational state of literally loving what is without a need for anything to change. Without a need for anything to change, which means the oh, agenda. Sorry, I'm in a meeting. Would you say, Jonathan? No, you got, you got interrupted. Oh, okay. Um, so, what that means is the agenda that things should be different than they are, and those people should realize that science should work this way, et cetera. Like, even my intensity when I talk about this stuff and how I get pissy about it and stuff. Even that is part of what doesn't need to change. Or even someone's resistance to all this is part of what doesn't need to change. So the love comes first. And then what's ironic about the love is that when people feel unconditionally loved and when they feel unconditional love, everything changes. So it's like the opposite. It's so paradoxical. It's so paradoxical. But it changes everything by not requiring change to get love. Amen. Yeah, it uh, creates a, cent uh, a place of uh, psychological safety in, in which to explore. I love that. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Thank you. I agree. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for, for hosting this uh, session. It's just really wonderful. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Hoffman, perhaps others if they'd like to comment. Um, so, Dr. Hoffman, you talked about the vision for having a, a mathematically precise theory of consciousness. And, but we've also heard that there are things that we thought were fundamental that are not fundamental, like <coughs> space-time. So I'd like to ask you, um, where do you think uh, mathematics is in the scale of fundamentalness? Is mathematics fundamental? Uh, so mathematics itself is infinitely complicated, right? There, there's no end to, so the mathematics that we know about is trivial to compared to the mathematics that we don't know. Uh, and, and so mathematics itself is infinite. Uh, I, it's relationship to consciousness. I, you know, so I think consciousness is fundamental. That, that's my ontology. Consciousness is fundamental or, or if you wish awareness. And, and I think that mathematics is is like the bones of consciousness. It's not the living organism, but it's the bones, and you need the bones for the living organism. And so I think that it's part, it's it's not separate from consciousness, but it's not the whole of consciousness. It's an integral aspect of consciousness. And as we and it's in, in some sense, 
I mean, I, I really love what, what Julia Mossbridge was just saying you know, about love and, and so forth. I think that's ultimately what the ultimate nature of consciousness really is. Um, and, and mathematics is a, is a desiccation of that, but it's an important desiccation of it, right? It, it, in some sense, you can't ever know the truth conceptually. You can only know it by being it, right? We are consciousness, so you can know it first person by being it but and you can get approximations you can get projections through mathematical theories and that's the way i view the mathematical theories and that's why i said we have uh, infinite job security because we'll never get to the end of it so so i think that the mathematics is important partly because it's easy for us to be dogmatic to say i i got it and you don't i i'm right well what's really nice in scientific theories that are mathematically precise is the mathematics tells you the limits of your own theories like space-time einstein's theory of space-time tells us great theory it stops at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters not 10 to the minus 33 trillion 10 to the minus 33 game over so that's what i love about mathematics and in, in terms of consciousness exploring itself um you know spiritual traditions talk about pointers and the pointers are just pointers the finger pointing to the moon is not the moon it's just a finger pointing to the moon well mathematics actually tells you that this pointer stops here and so it's a real antidote to dogmatism. So I, that's it's a complicated answer, but you can see, I think mathematics is, is the bones of consciousness, and it's also an antidote to dogmatism in the endless exploration of consciousness and its potential. Yeah, all right, thank you. Oh, we're doing another. I still like Karl Popper's theory that everything, has, if it's gonna be a scientific theory, it's gotta be falsifiable. We can never know the truth. Did you guys hear that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, we're gonna wrap up. Thank you guys so much for joining Thank us. You. Thank you, speakers, for joining us. Um, do you want we really couldn't have done this all without you, so thank you. If you got here late, there's a sheet of paper on the chairs. If you'd like to receive a copy of this recording, please share your email address so we can send it to you. There's also the donation link. Uh, please share it with people. We're going to be sharing this video, and as we've pointed out many times, this was um, not inexpensive, so we could use some help. Um, and really, really appreciate you all being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference and your evening, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.